you need to have them be quieter in the back? Well, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us today at Live from Santa Fe. Uh, it's coming to you from Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery in beautiful downtown Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I'm Andrea Fisher. Uh, we've decided to do this live presentation 20 times this month. And today is our second in the, uh, in the, the daily pottery demonstrations here in Santa Fe. Yesterday we had Ruby Panana from Zia Pueblo and we had a few technical difficulties and if that affected any of you or really we'd like to apologize for that. We'd like to make sure that uh, all the people on the East Coast are alive and well after that horrendous weather that you had yesterday and that um, you're, you know, you all came out of it as well as can be expected. The reason that we're doing these Live from Santa Fe videos and broadcasting them to you both on YouTube and Zoom is because Indian Market this year has been canceled. Indian Market takes place in the third week of August every year where thousands, literally thousands of natives from all over the United States, from Alaska to Florida, with an emphasis on the Southwest, bring their wares to sell. Most of the, the exhibitors depend on the sales of their pieces as a great part of their income. Some of them, it is their only annual income. And we have been, um, we have, felt that we need to support them as much as possible because here at Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery, we are really dedicated to selling authentic, handmade, traditionally crafted, and the best quality Native American pottery out there. And so we invited 27 potters because in a couple of these, presentations, there will be several family members. We've invited 27 potters to not only demonstrate what they do to create the beautiful work they make, but also to be able to sell some of their pieces here in the gallery so that they can survive with their families. Um, today, we have He, we, we've known Thomas forever, and he's such an affable, good-natured guy. We could not resist having him here. And today, uh, we will spend a few hours watching Thomas create his wonderful work.
the, uh, the one that I'm working on, by the time I build it up, it's sturdy enough to rotate back around while I start on another one and put that one to the side and so on. That way, that way you'll have, that way you'll have, uh, that way you'll know, you, you'll know when it's hard enough to put the next coil on. Why? Because if the coils are not, not, um, not sturdy enough, you can't build back on top of the other coils that you have just done. If I, if you kind of I explained that right there. But as you, you're going to see as I go along what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, and bear with me, uh, my uh, first uh, native tongue is my native language. <laughs> I, I, I always tell people that I, I didn't probably start speaking to English till I was like in the fourth grade or fifth grade. And, uh, you know, I mean, I speak my, my, my native tongue very fluently. And that's what, one thing I'm proud about. Yeah. And, and if you should break into uh, your native language, which is called? Uh, uh, Karis. Karis. Karis, right. And if you break into Karis while you're working, that's just fine. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you can always come back and translate. We have lots of time to do this. Right, right. So you're going to make a pot for us now. Where did you get the clay? Well, the clay comes from, come from uh, Santo Domingo Pueblo along within the reservation, right? So uh, when I first started potting was in uh, uh, 1992, around there. You know, I, did, I didn't know anything about, anything about the natural clay that we have. So when I first started potting, I, I was used to use a, a store-bought clay, commercial clay. So that's how I got started and, you know, worked with that. You can almost do anything with that kind of clay. But well, with this clay, it's got some limitations to where you can do uh, like plates, like huge plates. These ones, you know, it, it doesn't dry, dry, dry even enough to, for it not to crack. So that's one thing about the different kind of clays. So in 2006, when I got into the Indian market, I said, I'm going to go totally traditional. So now I gather all my clay and all my temper, which is in the, in the Pueblo. And that's the problem. Do you go get it yourself? Yes, 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 we do. We, I get a couple of my friends or my nephews, uh, my grandkids, we get, we get together and we all go, go get it because it's a time consuming process. The, the process of sifting it Sifting it, the, well, the process starts from when we get to the red clay area is digging it first, digging it and putting it together. And we sift it with the regular, do regular. You, do you sift it right there where, you, sift, di where you dig we, it? We, we sift it right there. That way we can put the, put what we don't use back right away. But during the winter time, if it's too cold, we take it home and we sift it inside, inside and then, but, we always bring it, bring back what we don't use back to, to the spot, and you know, offer it back to. to and how much, how much do you get at a time? It all, it all depends. It all depends on uh, a certain, a certain amount we, we can do at a, a certain day. Because the process takes about. If I'm going to do something like a five gallon gallon bucket, that is going to take me from start to finish this i'm just talking about the clay red clay it's going to take me at least maybe about a good four hours why because we're going to sift it first with uh with the screen that has bigger holes in it the second process is i use the gold sifter a gold sifter where they sift gold so that has a lot of a lot of uh little 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 holes it's it's a called a, a 60 mash which i prefer why because because uh i'm not i don't know if you're familiar with the old santa domingo pots you can see little little tiny tiny uh, pits in them that's because there's little little pumice rocks or little rocks that come along with the clay and they pop during the firing so i I did it, I started doing it to where, to where I sift it that way, you know, to take away the, the little pits, pits. But uh, 
Well, what did people use for sifters, you know, like 600 years ago? Well, I heard, what I heard is they, they used to use like a, either a cloth of some sort or, or maybe a, something like in a, a, a leather of some sort and they would soak it, soak it, soak it in and then let whatever goes through, through I'm going to use this plastic. They would put it in here and they would sift it that way. It was wet. So it would go through. So whatever was left, left, they would take that off, off, and you know, get rid of what what's on top. But now, nowadays, you know, with uh, with uh, all these uh, new new stuff going on, so I really prefer prefer the uh, the gold sifters. So, so in the old days, the what was left on top that that threw away. Right. And well, then, then they'd use what the watery stuff that was in the bottom after the water evaporated. Right, right. Or, okay. or in other words, or in other words, they probably just, you know, did the, just by feel of hand, just take out what was what was really rough within their hands. That's what I I, I would say, you know, because you know there was there really no, no really cloth around and stuff like that. Yeah. So, but uh, the process that I've uh, I've done is through trial and error, because I I don't come from a family of potters. So who taught you? I well basically like I said through trial and error I taught myself. I did some research on it back in the '90s up at uh, San Juan College, which is in, in Farmington. So I was reading about it and stuff like that. So I started painting some uh, ceramic pots that were already you know poured in a mold. So, you know, I got more interested, more interested. So I came back home and I said, wow. So there was only a couple of families making pots, you know, the traditional stuff. So, but it took me 14 years to figure out all the, all the clay mixing and all the chemistry behind it with the, with the white slip, with the, uh, the natural uh, pigment paints, yeah. So it took me 14 years to figure it out and now now I've got it down to where I understand it a whole little, a whole lot more. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that you know there's a lot of more things that you know that I don't understand, which is fine with me. Which you know, is fine yeah, yeah. When me. Ruby was here yesterday, we were talking about clay, and you know, to be a clay artist, a potter like you are, you need to be a chemist, you need to be a geologist. You need to be a botanist. You need to be a very skilled um, artist, and you need to be a painter. I mean, you need to be so many things. And I think most people don't realize how much time and effort it takes to, um, to have the background to begin to make a piece of pottery. I, I, completely, I, I completely agree with you. You know, I talk to some of my friends that are jewelers and uh, you know painters and stuff like that. But with us potters, we first we get the clay, then we make our canvas, then we make our paint, and and then we have to do the 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 firing and stuff. So that is a lot of stuff, you know, like you just said, all the chemists and all the botanist and whatever words you used. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I completely understand. Well, I, I completely agree with you on and, that. And the most dangerous part of doing it is that perhaps that last step, the firing? The last step is, uh, you know, with the outside firing, it's a 50-50, a 50-50 shot on it. You know, when I first started, wow, you should, you should, you should see all this, might as well call it black pottery because <laughs> Because I didn't, I didn't understand the firing technique. You know, I didn't know that the higher of the temperature you go is when the the the, the, the smoke clouds that that come onto the fire from the beginning of the firing starts what fading off as the fire gets hotter. You know, and it is a dangerous thing. Uh, several years ago. You know, without me knowing, my shirt caught on fire, and this <laughs> oh, is what dear. happened. So oh. this is what happened. It, this was right in the middle of the firing, firing. So I thought it was just hot, 
little did I know a few seconds later my whole arm was oh my, <laughs> my whole arm was on fire. So uh, so I I now use welding gloves which go up this high. So mm -hmm. uh, you know we like we did a firing at your house uh, uh, several years back. You know for Indian market which which was something new for the people that come come uh, from all over all over the world. I'm gonna say right. So, uh, so today, like you said, we're going to be remaking some pots and do well, you have any questions? Yeah, well, let's see what, what you're up to. Okay. Well, this is, this is the clay that I, I, I brought with me today. And this was mixed, uh, I say, we're in August. August now. This yeah. was mixed probably in June, middle part of June. So I put the clay away for it to 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 be stored away. That way, I can work it a whole lot better when uh, when you put it away for several several days, several several. Well, I I, I say several months. So the first thing I do is, like I said, I put it away. Then when I'm ready to work it, I, you know, I get this. Uh, I don't know what you call this in the pottery world. I, I don't have no formal training in art of any kind, so. I'll, Looks kind of like a cheese slicer to me. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Or, uh, or a hot, uh, hot butter knife going through some butter. Now that's the clay that you have dug at San Domingo right. and then cleaned that clay and prepared it to bring here today to make some pots. Right. right. Well, well, actually, actually, I, we, for, we, we jumped. So there's another step where I process also the white sand, which is the temper for, for the clay. So during the drying stage, it doesn't crack, crack on me. So tell me what temper is. Temper, temper is, is some, either it's volcanic ash or sand. So I say, I, where I get it, I, you know, you know, being a geologist and asking people around, you know, they're looking at it, it is, it is volcanic ash, which is some of the stuff that, boom, went up first during, 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 the, during this, in this time and era area where they had a lot of volcanoes and we're in New Mexico and we had with all the lava rock that you see we had quite a few of them well anyways it's the stuff that went up but slowly came down very very fine very very fine and started compacting 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 to where it's almost it's almost a like a, a sandstone rock sandstone rock anyways Anyways, it comes together to where, where I go and get the sand. It's, it's pretty compact, but it's not that hard. It's not that hard. You can use some sort of scraper to scrape, scrape off on the side of a, of a hill. But mm -hmm. it's, 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 it, has to be, it has to be in that area. I've tried other sands as temper, and it just didn't work. So the only thing that works with the Santa Domingo rat clay and the temper is those two together. And they're like, uh, I say they're about a couple of miles apart from where I get the clay and from where I get the sand, the, the, the volcanic ash, mm -hmm. right. And- uh, is, this, is the temper kind of like the glue that holds the, the clay together? Well, it's, 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 to me, it's actually like the line that you put in cement, you uh -huh. know, to where the, the, the line doesn't, does it, uh, doesn't crack the cement during the drying stage. So that, uh -huh. that's, that's how I, I explain it all the time. Yeah, because if we were gonna, if we didn't, if we didn't add any, uh, any uh, temper to, to this kind of clay and just mixed it with the clay, it's, 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 gonna, it's gonna crack off. Is it gonna crumble then? It's, yes, yeah. yes, yes, it is. So as you can feel this clay, this clay's been, been put away for your, for a, a couple of months, a couple of months, because when you first, when you first, 
When I first mixed the clay together back in the day, back in 2006, 2007, I wanted to use it right away, right away. And, you know, so I talked to some people about it. I said, you're supposed to put it away and let it cure, you know, let it cure. And I said, oh. I said, explain more to me. So they did. So did. So they did. As a matter of fact, it was, it was your son, uh, Derek, that explained that to me, you know, uh, so I said, wow, all right, cool. Well, it's like women and fine wine. We just improve with age. Oh, oh, don't, don't, don't get me to the, the, uh, to, to the women and the wine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. No, no, just no. two subjects we're going to stay away from today. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, you, you, you put, put it away. Oh, wow, man. I can work it. But if I try to work it like a week or maybe two days, you know, during the coiling, coiling, when I'm trying to coil, they still break up. You know, mm -hmm. this thing has to get all the, the air out all the, when I put it away. Uh, so anyways, that's, 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 the pro, that's the process. And the process normally takes us like the whole day, a whole day from start, start to finish. And then after that, after that, you put, you, uh, you you have to dry mix it, you know. You have to you have to put put uh, the red and the white, and that takes a lot of the trial and error. You know, I couldn't get it down to where where uh, how much I should put off the red, how much I should put off the white. You know, so mm -hmm. it was it all. It took me about maybe two to three years to figure out the right amount. So with that. I, I'm not going to share that. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, that's that's one of those things that uh, one of those things. Uh, I try to keep it to, to try to keep it, you know, to myself right now. But within with, within a few years, I am going to teach what I have learned, what I've taught myself, what this book, The Power of Santo Domingo by Kenneth Chapman, has taught me is. Uh, I'm going to teach this back to my to to the people of my pueblo, yeah. And uh, a lot of people are really interested. But I I've told them, you know, give me a head start on this and let me establish myself. You know, uh, I mean, you know, I treat it as a business now. You know, just like any any other business, you know, you have to to uh, to run it the way you want it to run. You know, I'm I'm not a good business I'm not a good businessman, but I'm a good. Uh, I try to be the best artist I can be, but I'm learning along the way. So, um, so with with uh, so with that, you know, let me get started with with Great. the play. I some people some people just I seen some artists some uh, some potters they just have their their clay clay put away and then they take you know a handful you know out of it. But me, I like to. I like to cut it up. Uh, I like to cut it up uh, here and there into uh, bars. So is that cheating a little? Excuse me. Is that cheating a little? I. You know what? The reason I do that too is because I want to see if. I want to see sometimes if there's air left within uh -huh. the, in the clay. So, you know, if I if I take like that off, right? And I try to roll it, you can see all the I'm creating a lot of air Rebels. pockets. Yeah. So so that's the reason I do it like that is because look, mm -hmm. you can see that this clay's been been sitting around for a couple of months. Uh in my, my, my store bin. While I have it stored and curing it, I just take once every maybe a few days, I will sprinkle it a little just to keep it moist as it, it, it can be. And I always stand it up in a lawn, in, in, in the lawn way. That way, the weight of, its, of itself will start compacting. And then maybe like a month into it, I would turn it around and turn it the other way and let it start compacting. So these are the little things that I've, you know, after doing it uh, from 2006, I, I don't know how many years that is. Well, all the uh, little tricks in those 14 years of learning. Oh, that's 14 years? Okay, yeah. well, 
yeah, well, see, I've, 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 I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning. There's a lot of ways this clay reacts to different ways. Like, just recently, uh, the humidity affected it really, really, really bad because uh, it's been raining for for about a week and a half in in, uh, in in the pueblo. So, with the firing, the humidity, the wood is is wet and and so on. Yeah. So. It has affected, so I just completely stopped firing right now. So, uh, uh, you know, like we said, the, the things have changed. The Indian market has has a thing going. Yeah, so I, I'm not even ready for that either. So, anyways, I start laying them back out here. Looks like you're putting them in that plastic bin. Yes, I put a put it back in there because. Uh, I want it to, I'll put the cover back on later and I just take a few bars at a time to work with. Because if you leave it out, this, this clay kind of gets uh, pretty sturdy right away. So you have to, uh, so you have to just grab a little at a time. So I never waste the clay at all. I keep I take every little piece well, it's back so, and put it back in there. Yeah. Well, it's so hard to get and so hard to prepare. It's exactly. Every, but exactly. you make such gigantic pots sometimes that uh, those little tiny bits aren't going to go very far. <laughs> yes, yes. The, 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 the huge pots, the huge pots. I love doing that. But uh, this, this summer, this summer, this... This time, uh, you know, not feeling a hundred percent my myself, how health wise, but uh, you know, I love doing around this time is doing the huge pop pops, yeah. but I stuck around to where some stuff that I can really control during the firing and stuff like that. But uh, I'm I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Yeah. So. We'll go ahead and start. We'll start with the coiling here. Now, how many potters are there? And would you prefer me to say Kiwa or Santa Domingo? You know, I, I prefer Kiwa. As a matter of fact, I, uh -huh. I signed all my pieces uh, uh, key. Kiwa. Well, I'll do my best. Yeah, you know, yeah. Santa Domingo is imprinted in my brain. Right, right, right. Well, you know, I, uh, you know, in 2009, I was with the tribal gov government, uh, with the governor's office, mm -hmm. and uh, they, that's the year they, they uh, decided to uh, go back to the original name. You know, Kiwa is the original name for, San, for, for the Pueblo, right? So, uh, so they decided to do that. So I did a a, a new uh, tribal seal for the for the pueblo, and you'll you'll see it along uh, within the reservation. The the clinic there is using it, the gas station, and so on. I don't know if I don't know if uh, officially they've 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 changed it. Uh, so uh, well, when the Spaniards came at the end of the 1500s. They made a lot of changes. Oh yes, they, yes and yes, they yes. changed the name of the the pueblos. And pueblo is merely a Spanish word that means village. Right. And um, now you know there's been sort of a, a slow movement to change the name back to the original um, communities, the, the name that the community gave themselves. Um, and with the Spaniards, the uh, they brought the Catholic Church, and so the names of the Pueblos were saint names, and uh, do you know who Santa Domingo, Saint Dominic is? Yes, yes, uh, Saint, saint Dominic is, is, is a patron saint of the Pueblo, and that's also my younger brother's name, Dominic. Uh, so uh, yesterday was our annual feast, uh, so we'll, with like the everything else, uh, it was uh, it was canceled, just like every other Pueblo or 
any other things going on. Now, well, how, how many people live at Santo Domingo? Well, the... Uh, the, 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 the the census, the last time I seen it was uh, people actually living within in the pueblos around maybe uh, five, five, five thousand. Five thousand. Yeah. Wow. And it's Santo Domingo is a pretty. It's the biggest, the biggest, probably the biggest pueblo along the Rio Grande. Yeah. Along Rio Grande, and then there's some, some, some kids go to school, and some people that live at it in Albuquerque, Santa well, Fe, and area. Do you, do you live uh, on the Pueblo? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, last last couple of years ago, I moved back. Uh, I moved back and I started uh, working on the uh, family home. But uh, last year, right after Indian Market, my daughter got scheduled to get deployed with the New Mexico National Guard. She works with in the, the pharmacy pharmacy area. She's in, in the military? Yes, yeah, she's in the uh -huh. military. Well, wow. As a matter of fact, she's after uh, several months, she's back. She got deployed to Poland, but now she's back. So she asked me to take care of her place in Albuquerque along with my granddaughter, and she's six years old. So me and her, me and her almost fought for a whole year. <laughs> no, no, she's a really good girl. She's she, she's really good. She's she's a potter too. She started to pot, so that's one of those things that we had a one-on-one -on -one connection together. Is some um, teaching her how to speak. Oh, pot. and as potters and as six-year-olds. Right, right, right. <laughs> because and, I can see you being a six-year-old right along with exactly. her, Thomas. Exactly. We knew we we went down to where. We had to go get a little table and two little chairs, just like, uh, you know, in school. So, you know, I sat along with her in there. And I have some pictures that I, I'll, I'll, I'll show you or I'll, I'll put it up on uh, a website that I'm creating. Uh, yeah. It's not ready. I'm, I'm not the technology guy. I'm trying to get somebody uh, to, to, to start one for me. But anyhow... Uh, this is the stage. I get my coils. It all depends. I seen some other. I seen potters doing uh, huge coils. Me, I go. This is this is the size of my coils that I love to do. Why? Because I have more control working it with my fingers, and I know how much. Uh, how how much. How much, how much I, I can feel, and I know sometimes the coils hollow out while you roll in them. That's why I do this in the bars, because you don't want no, you don't want no air pockets within in the in the coils during the drying stage. You know, maybe you'll find an air pocket, but if you if you do have an outer pocket, it's going to show up during the firing. That's when, boom, well, it cracks. Well, and the reason is, is that the air heats faster than the clay body. Exactly. And when that happens, um, it's kind of the way popcorn works. Right. And it just blows the heck out of your piece. I'm going to put my glasses on. I... But look at how even those coils are. I mean, you can make wonderful breadsticks. Yes. I might have I, to have you come over and we can make some breadsticks oh, together because that's, oh, they're just perfect. There you go. Okay. So the theme is when the coils are going to be put together, you have to wet it a little. That way it will stick. And I got my guard dog with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's our dog, honey. And she's, mm -hmm. there's someone at the door with a dog. Oh, I see. Yes. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. <laughs> yes, I, you know, I mean, like I said, through the trial and error, I've, I'm starting to create uh, new shapes and sizes. Uh, a couple of years, a couple of, Years ago, I really started doing some square and uh, different kinds of shapes just to see how the clay reacts. And I, I learned a lot from it. Uh, 
not just regular, you know, round pots. Yeah, so, I remember a lot of your square pieces. Yeah, they're I think really that, fun and unusual. Yeah, I think it just uh, I was uh, I was experimenting. Let's put it that way. Okay, the next step is I put the coils together, and you make sure you try to get. as even as it can be as you can okay now is this going to be a big pot a medium pot i i'm going to do i i think the time limit that we have i'm going to do some uh smaller pots and I'm going to use a stainless steel bowl for my base. Mm -hmm. Back in the day they used to use a lot of uh, baskets. Some baskets or either a pot that was already already made that they would take off on the bottom and they would let it dry out. And, and why would they start it that way? They started. They they started that way, is because you gotta have some sort of base. You gotta start from somewhere, just like a building. You gotta have a foundation of some sort. It's in other words, it's a foundation. That way you can start building up. Start start building up. That way, it won't collapse on you. It won't collapse on and you. And also, do you use that bowl to sort of turn? You, t you can turn the pot then because it isn't stuck exactly, on the tabletop. Exactly, exactly. You can, you can easily just move it around this way with a little, t t t not touching the whole pot. Because if you, st if you start touching the pot, you know, it's not dry enough. It's going to start getting, uh, one side is going to start being bigger than the other side. So... Back in the day, they used to use a cloth in there, a cloth, a cloth of some sort, you know, a fabric of some sort. Me, I prefer to use a piece of a plastic. I used to prefer to use the piece of plastic. That way, that way we won't, you won't get too many wrinkles on the pots. You know, it's more flat, flat and stuff. But I, I save all my plastic. I reuse them and reuse them and reuse them again. <laughs> so all your environmentalists, I, I just, I don't use a lot of plastic. I use the same thing. Okay, next step is, I used to use the gourds. Used to use the gourds. I still use them once in a while, but I've, this is a whole lot easier. Wait, I don't, what, I, what is that? It's, a, it's it's just a rubber a rubber piece uh -huh. a rubber piece that uh you know I get at the local uh, uh clay shop in Albuquerque, and this is what uh -huh. you start taking all the air off what you have, what you coil for the bottom. Well, so we're we're starting from from the bottom up. So as we go along, you're gonna see once I start building up that this doesn't come in handy uh, at all. It starts it's, it comes in handy more more on the bottom or with the huge pots as I go inside and, you know, start putting all the coils together. All well, right. yesterday when Ruby was here, um, her solution was a piece of a broken coffee cup. Yeah, you can yeah. almost use any, anything. And I, you know, uh, like I was, this morning I was scraping some pots and uh, what I use is from, a, you know, uh, from, from a... a from a vegetable, a can of vegetables or something. So once you take that, uh, take, take off that can, the top of it, you uh -huh. know, you take that piece of metal and I fold it so it's already kind of like rounded out right here. So I fold it in half. So that's what I use to scrape the excess from, from a pot that I built, especially in the, the inside, because I love to have my pots uh, not too thick. But when I first started, my pots were heavy, yeah. huge. Now I, I improved a lot to where I, uh, they're a little thinner. You can use the old, old uh, 
pots that I used to make as a doorstop or something like that. <laughs> yeah. An anchor. Yeah. But there unfortunately, you go. Yeah, there there's you go. no anchor. place to anchor anything around well, here. <laughs> well, you can use it as an iron. You can get it uh -huh. hot. Yeah. Okay. As we go along now, we're taking all the all the air out and and as I go along, you're flattening out the bottom of the pot. I mean, this is it, all the years that I've been doing pots. Uh, you know, it's see, there's some excess waste that I always put back in here that I, I save. While you're doing that, I will just explain to people who are watching that the camera is on a selection of pieces that uh, Thomas has for sale. Okay. And um, right now, they're all up on our website so that you can get exact measurements and descriptions of them and prices uh, for them. And in the email blast that we sent out this morning, we were having, the problems that we were having yesterday were innumerable, but one of them was that if you clicked on saying, I want to buy this piece, you have to check a little box that says, I'm not a robot. Well, something got screwed up with uh, the robots. Anyway, um, the, uh, the pieces that are, are there that are shown on the screen are all displayed on our website. You just go to our website and then click on artists, and then click on Thomas Tenorio. And they start at the top with the most expensive one and go down to the bottom in descending order of price to the least expensive ones in the bottom. Now, if, if you're watching us on YouTube and you have any questions for Thomas, don't hesitate to email us a question because what I can do is read it out to Thomas and he can... Uh, he could talk to you, you know, directly on the screen and answer your, your question, and uh, we'll be happy to do that. And, uh, you know, no question is, uh, every question is acceptable and fun, and uh, anyway. But, you know, Thomas uh, will, you know, in the time where, you know, he's going to be coiling, we can talk about a few other things like, you know, what it's like to live in the Pueblo and what he does for fun and, and tell us more about his daughter who just came back and uh, all from her military service and all those other kinds of things uh, as we go. But in the meantime, it's going to be really fun to, to watch this pot rise into the air. Uh, what are you doing there, Thomas? Right now, I'm still doing the bottom. As you can see, I done the other side, and I flipped it now to where I have more, more better, where I can see more better for air bubbles that have created during the, during during the time when I put the coils together. I can see one right here. So all I do is just pop that, and then there it is. One less, one less air bubble, air pocket is. Well, as Thomas was saying earlier, that the air air bubbles in the clay as you make them are um, sort of the nemesis of pottery making because they're going to come back and bite you and bite you really hard. Right. At some place, and you may go through all this work of digging the clay and cleaning the cat clay and making the temper and coiling the thing and drying it and sanding it and painting it and then you fire it and it breaks into a thousand pieces because of those air bubbles. So it's always, you know, a, a good idea um, that, you know, Thomas is definitely uh, making sure that there are no air bubbles in, in his pieces. Let me do a side view. I don't know if you can see that. See how, see how even the the clay is. This part, it's all. I try to keep it as even all the way around as I can. That way, during the drying stage, the whole pot will be drying evenly. Because I've learned from through try and error 
if there's one side that's way too thick than the other side of the other wall, you know, it's going to take a whole long, longer for the other side to dry because it's thicker and that's when the cracks create also too. And is that because the clay shrinks during the drying process? Yes, yes. That's one thing about this clay is it shrinks about uh, a half an inch to an inch during the drying stages. Ooh. It sh it shrinks. So if there's some if somebody orders a piece from me a certain height, I always go at least a one inch, one inch high higher or the width of it. That way, when it dries, it's, it's it stays the same same what they ordered, right? Now, and when when you fire it, does it shrink some more? I've I some people say if it, it has. The, it shrinks during the farming stage, but I've kind of noticed maybe just little, little, little centimeters of it, but nothing, nothing major. We're not talking about anything like a quarter of an inch or to a half an inch. I, I haven't noticed that. Maybe, maybe a maybe a couple of eighths of an inch or somewhere around there with this certain clay. So it's during the drying when those to the shrink. It's during the drying. It's during the drying where all the the water evaporates from. from yeah. So from, when it when it does shrink and crack, God forbid, um, what do you do then? Me myself, my myself. Uh, Everything during the drying stage, that, that's, that's kind of the second, second hardest thing is I've got a room to where I put all my pots in there and there's no window open, no doors, go, no doors going, I mean, shutting in and out. So it just stays a room temperature to where everything, everything's drying evenly. But if you have a little wind coming from this side, you know, eventually this side's going to dry faster than that. That's when it creates the cracks also, mm -hmm. right? Now, mm. is it easier in the wintertime when the humidity, or I shouldn't say the wintertime, is it easier when the humidity is a little higher so that it helps it dry more slowly or when you, sometimes it's just dry as a bone here? I love it as dry as a, you know, as a bone, like you said. You know, the, the humidity affects a lot of it. Even during the drying stage when I have it in sight, yeah, it affects it. It takes maybe a couple more days longer for the pot to dry. But if it's staying at a cooler, cooler room, cooler temperature, as a matter of fact, sometimes, you know, you can use a fan to circulate the air, but it's got to be cool air. It's can't, it, can't be, it can't be hot air. You know, just as I have a little fan that just circulates the room, and that, that's it evenly, evenly. But if you do it from one side, it's going to start down. So I've got a, the ceiling fan works really good. So besides being a chemist and a botanist and a geologist and an artist, you have to be a meteorologist too? You know what? You, that's, <laughs> you, you have to. It all, you know, the, the, effect, the effect of the, uh, you know, the wood itself, you know, the, the, the inside the wood, you know, you, I prefer using cedar. Cedar, cedar. You mean wood. the wood you're going to fire yeah, with? Yeah, the, the wood that uh -huh. I'm going to fire with. I prefer it to be completely dry. We you know a little sap within the cedar. You know, you know it, it affects if it affects the pots, especially if it splashes out a little. When it gets on this kind of slip, you know, it's apparently going to stay there. It's and you know, you have to know all these things because if you don't, how do you make your car payment if you don't have anything to sell? <laughs> That is true. That's very, 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 very true. Yeah, I. Uh, Much less eat. Yeah, you, you, this, this stuff. Like I said, through try on error, I know what to do and not, and not what to do. You know, uh -huh. I, I, I've got it. I've, I've understood it. I've understood it. Understood it. How everything kind of reacts to everything. But like I said, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. So how long have you been making pots now? Ah, uh, since 1992. Oh, when the dinosaurs roamed New yeah, Mexico, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was, uh, when I was, when, when I was uh, still walking faster. <laughs> when I still was dancing in high heels. <laughs> oh, this is a little part about you I didn't know, yeah, Thomas. Yeah, this, the disco era. We go, but we'll say disco era. 
Okay, as you can see this, we've got this one pretty themed out. So the next step on this is I've got a, I have this to do that. Now I've got a smaller one, smaller thing. What's two. that? Is that made out of rubber also? Yeah, this is also made out of uh -huh. rubber, yeah. I don't know what you would call these. What does this say? Oh, hey, look. I think they're called ceramic kidneys or something like that. Oh, okay, yeah. You know, you know more about the, what they're called than I do. But wheel thrown potters use them as well. But um, there are no Native American, traditional Native American pottery that is wheel thrown. No, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, I, lo I have a lot of people, a lot of people that question me at certain shows and stuff because... You know, I've gotten down to where, you know, you know, with the, with the shapes and sizes, you know, to yeah. where, you know. And I, the weight. Yeah, and the weight. You should see some of them. They used to lean this <laughs> way and lean this way. But, I, you know, I mean, after so many years, it's just like anything, you get good at your, your job. Yeah. yeah. Well, I you mean, know. The, the, it's the, not good. It's not perfect. Pablo Pottery, my pots aren't perfect. That's the first thing I tell Customers, when they come to a booth or to when I talk to them, I say, "You're not going. It's not going to come out perfect. If you, if if it is, uh, more power to me. But I, I know <laughs> there's not a perfect pot I've ever done, and I don't expect in my pottery time to have, to do a perfect one. Yeah. Well, you know, all the pots that we have here in the gallery are made by the exact method that uh, Thomas is demonstrating today we have no wheel thrown pots and we have no molded pots there's something that they call ceramics or greenware and what that means is that whoever is um, claiming to make that pot goes to the craft store and buys a piece of pottery that is um, already poured into a mold dried and then they take it home and they paint it right. uh, greenware molded pots we don't have any of those and they're not part of the the native american tradition and so um, that is something that we do not carry because we want this tradition to um, con continue on all right sometimes i sh if i think sometimes if i think there's a uh, a little air on in the bottom, you know. Just just from me, I I I like to double check, cause some people once they get going, they just they just get going. And so now I feel better that I looked on the bottom because once you start building it up, there's no way you're gonna be able to take the pot out. Uh, but it will be easy to take out after it shrinks. Then. Oh yeah, after yeah. It sh after it shrinks, boom, it just slips out quick. But I normally take it out when there it's still a little, little damp. As long as it's sturdy enough for it to uh, to sit, for yeah. the bottom to sit. Back in the day, I used to take them out too early, and then you know it would either it, either it would sag or either it would. Uh, crack on the bottom so I know when to do it now I know when to do it and it's all timing it's all timing Andrea all this has to do with timing when to do this when not to do it so as you can see on the top I like to take some of the top off before the next coil. Because as you can see this, the next coil, we're gonna, it's got a dance here and there along the coil. So I take that off, that way when I lay my next coil, it's gonna go on evenly. And it's gonna stick a whole lot easier. If that makes any sense. There we are. 
put that away for a little bit. Well, are you going to start rolling coils? Yeah, I'm going to roll, roll some more coils. I'm uh -huh. going to build it up to about maybe a couple inches, inches, and then we're going to put that away. Well, while, while you're doing that, maybe you can tell me about your daughter and that sweet little six-year-old granddaughter that you have. Okay. Well, like I said, my daughter was de deployed with the National Guard uh, in how, October. How old is she? Uh, she Autumn is 25. She's uh -huh. 25 years old, yes. And uh, my granddaughter, she's six years old. Right. As a matter of fact, though, uh, my daughter's husband, uh, Adrian, he's also in the Air Force. Uh, right before she got deployed, she was, she was still in Texas before she got deployed. Uh, that was last September. So my daughter, I mean, my granddaughter and Adrian, they went down right before she got deployed uh, from uh, Fort Hood. Anyways, I think they, I don't know what they talked or how they said, so they decided just to tie the knot, which was, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say, but I didn't find out until my granddaughter got back and she spilled the beads. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> She spilled the said, beads. Yeah, she said, but they're, they're going to have a formal ceremonial, but, you know, just, you know, to be uh, on the safe side and stuff like that. So they got married down there. Yeah, uh, in Texas, and then she got deployed uh, a couple of days later. But uh, she's back now from deployment. She was in Poland. When did she come back? She got, came back a couple of days ago. A couple oh, of days nice, ago, nice. Right? A couple of days ago, she came back. They had a, they had a little ceremony over at uh, Rio Rancho, over at the armory, right? And we had a little get-together ourselves. So right now, she's... She put in some some paperwork, so she's gonna be be uh her husband is in the Air Force, so he's gonna be stationed in Washington State. So they're leaving on Friday up there. Oh. So she's gonna transfer up to the National Guard up in uh, Washington too. So my granddaughter, I believe she's gonna stay a couple more weeks, and uh, her grandma's gonna gonna uh, either they're gonna fly her up there or drive her up there. Now, is but, she in first grade? Yes, yes. She's uh -huh. going to be in second grade now. She's uh -huh. going to be in second grade. So who gets to teach her at home, Thomas? Is that you? What's that? Are you her homeschooler? Well, well you don't want. She's, you know, with all this technology, she knows more about the iPad, the tablet. She's teaching me. <laughs> she's really honestly teaching me. So I just got me a tablet uh, uh, last week. So she's showing me how to work it because she already has one. And... Uh, and it's, uh, it's so funny that everybody's laughing about it, that she's teaching me. But uh, I, I, I'm teaching her pottery. She's teaching me the technology thing. Yeah. So, so they're going to so be going up there Friday. And, uh, you know, due to the, uh, to, the, to the pandemic and stuff like that, it's uh, the only time I've been going into to the villages to do the firing and stuff stuff like that uh you know uh so i have to get a pass every every time i go into the village so you live in albuquerque with your, your yes, granddaughter I live, I live, and then I you live at yeah. her, her place uh during the time when she was gone so i actually took care of my granddaughter for almost a year and sent her to school and all this and that, yeah. you know yeah so but it was uh it, it, it was it, it was we had fun we had fun but she misses her mom she misses her mom. Now, how is uh, Santa Domingo Pueblo doing during the pandemic? Well, just like any other place, you know, just like any other place, any any other community, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, it's got its ups and downs and stuff like that. But I I believe the the tribal government has uh, you know took uh, uh, serious steps in in uh, uh, trying to control it and stuff like that. Uh, they've been giving tests, uh, you know, over there. I, as a matter of fact, a couple of times I got tested over there all the way back, coming back from Albuquerque. So uh, I, believe, I believe there's a lot of people that recovered. But the other neighboring Pueblos, they, they're in the same boat uh, as we are. But uh, we, we as, as a Pueblo nations, we, we've 
they've taken it upon themselves to, con to, to, to minimize, you know, minimize it as much as we can, just like any other place, we're wearing masks. Uh, now, if I was going to help you fire, you wouldn't make me carry all the wood. Would I be allowed to come into San Domingo Pueblo? Uh, no, actually, they're not. They're not letting any uh, non-tribal members in, uh, mm -hmm. and we, which is good. I understand it. I myself have to get screened before I go into the into the pueblo because I live in Albuquerque, yeah. and uh, I don't mind it. I don't complain. I don't, you know, I, I don't say anything. I just follow. The rules, rules. Yeah. Well, what about getting out of the pueblo if you want to go to the grocery store? Because there isn't one at at San Domingo. Yes, at there's Kiwa. not one, but there's it's a limitation of uh, a couple of people, uh, couple adults coming out. The 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 kids aren't allowed to. Uh, yeah. Uh, allowed to uh, to to leave the pueblo, and well, they they have checkpoints. Is there is out. there a school? At there, the pueblo? There's a school. We have a, our own uh, uh, tri tribal school. Well. It's a it's a public school which is uh, right off elementary I twenty five from uh, yeah. uh we have the the preschool right across from the elementary the middle school also yeah so and, that's where I went to school there too. and and if you want to go if you're going to high school do you go someplace else it, that, that's that, that's that's your choice you can either most of uh, our tribal members they go to Bernalillo High School. Uh -huh. Some of them go to the Indian school in Santa Fe, where I went to school at, and some other some other kids go, you know, private school here and there, just just like any other people. But our main school is our own Santa Domingo Public School and then Bernalillo Public School, which are they they tran uh, transport them. And I believe uh, Santa Fe Indian School transports every day also, mm -hmm. but here at the Indian School there's a dormitory, so I got to stay there four years. They put up with me over there. Uh, four years. <laughs> you on your own for four years? I oh, was, I God, was. I'm glad that air is over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go again. Now, you're going to have to wet down a little more of the clay again. This part, you get to start squeezing the coils. Oh. Hey, Thomas, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I oh. hope you don't mind. I have a question from Sue Baldwin. Okay. Sue is asking, are your white and black slips uh, or paints for the surface designs also found for Kiwa? Uh, yes, yes, they are. Uh, the red slip, as you're coming up on La Bajada Hill, and you see all the red, you know, all the sandstone, but a little ways from I-25, uh, east is where I get the red slip, which is the the bottom the bottom part of the Santo Domingo pottery. Uh, Tara, could you pick one up and and show sure. people? Well, the the one back here is the orange. That that's the slip. That's a natural red slip. Yes, uh, the white itself is. A little ways from, ah, oh, my hands are, you can just turn it. Okay, there you are. That's the natural, natural uh, red, red slip. Sometimes it's, it turns orange if the firing is a little, little higher. The white slip here is also from in that area. And that's the, that's the slip that we are having difficulty of getting. Uh, for, for the Pueblo. But uh, lately, I'm, I'm in luck that I have a friend that supplies me the, the white natural slip because there's nothing else that turns the white natural, I mean, the, the black pigment, pigment of the uh, honeybee plant. Nothing turns it, turns it black. It, the white slip and that have to come together chemically wise to turn the black the black into black oh and so maybe, maybe you want to ask me more questions yeah. on that so yeah. the, the white slip is is a rock uh uh it's that it's, you it that you grind up it's a clay it's it's i i say it's i say it's a it's a clay i've never got it analyzed or anything or what it's called and stuff but uh it's called iyatik, iyatik. That's what I, I know. It's, I don't know what it's, 
call it the English name or anything like that, you know. That's, a, that's, that's what it's called in, in, in the Pueblo. And, and what does it look like when, you, when it's, take, it's, it's taken out of the ground? It's, 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 like, a, it's like a rock. It's like yeah. a... It's, just, just think this is dry, right? And it's, it comes off, it comes off, off where, it's, it's where, you, where you get it from. I've never been actually to, to the place where they get it. Why? Because it's owned by a private landowner, which is the neighboring, neighboring to, the, uh, to the Santo Domingo Reservation. And so that's the, the, the Pueblo doesn't the, own the land don't, don't, where don't, you find that. We, we don't, we never, we did, we did own it at once, but that family, the, that private family owns it. So in the 70s, in the 1970s, uh, right before, right before they were going to bulldoze it, mm-hmm. the, the, the people, the people that owned that property, they didn't want to be liable because this thing was turning into a, you know, a cave and he didn't want to be liable. That family didn't want to be liable if anybody got trapped under there or in there. So in the, in the, in the late, in, in the seventies, right before he was going to bulldoze it, he went and got so many buckets out of there. How do I know this is because I know the kid that grew up over there. Well, he was a kid. He, he, he was a kid then. Uh, Anyways, he, he, they went right before they bulldozed it, they, uh, he took some buckets out. So he went around the village and, you know, there's only a couple of families that bought what, was, what he took out. That was the last of it. That was the last of it. But so happened, I met a guy that grew up on that ranch. So that's where I got the, the get the slip. It's not, he can't go on there. I think he, he said he picks it off what's left on top of the ground. So that's what I get. But a whole bu- bucket supply could last me about maybe three or four years. I'm down to, to my last bucket, so I'm going to oh. have to arrange with uh, Mr. Vargas is his name. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, ho- that's the one thing, because I tried slips from, from Hopi, South Dakota, anywhere I could see it, anybody offered me. But there was no other slip, no, no other stuff that turned my paint black. And so um, you, that slip is the, the beige colored slip? Right. The gray, right, right. okay. And it, so then when you mix it with something else, that's what makes the black. Right, What's right. the something else? The something else is, uh, you know, they call it the honeybee plant. And then, I don't know if uh, walk is a Spanish word, walk, but that's what we call it, it's walk. Walk. You know, I, I know what it is, okay. Thomas. It's a, a wild, you, you cook it down? Yes, yes, Okay, yes, it's exactly. a wild spinach. It's right. part it's of the exactly. spinach family. Right. And, you know, Popeye got really strong because he ate lots of iron oh, from yes, his Kansas yes. spinach. Of, and so there's a lot of iron awesome. in, in yeah. that uh, um, plant. And when it is concentrated by cooking it down right. that um, you get these these rocks of almost pure iron, iron oxide. Right. And when iron oxide fires, uh, it's heated to a certain temperature, it turns black. Exactly. And that's where the black comes from. Right. Now that's very different from the black pottery that's made in uh, New Mexico because the black pottery is the result of firing the, the local clay and removing the oxygen from the firing. Mm-hmm. And because of the chemical content of the clay, that's what turns the, the pots black. But the black slip you see there is the result of cooking down that wild spinach that grows here in, into New Mexico and cooking it and drying it in such a way that it becomes a rock. Um, exactly. And you let it dry into rocks. And then like the Japanese uh, use an ink stone. Right. The, uh, the rocks are ground on a stone and mixed with water. And that becomes your paint that will eventually turn black in the firing process. 
Right, right. You you explained it down to where. Okay, as a matter of fact, this uh, last screen we make to we make some paint again. Those ones last quite a while, but they, when you're drying them out, whatever's left on the bottom, whatever caramelizes from the plant itself, is going to be left on the bottom, and it's a uh, it's it's sappy. It's it's like a syrup. It's mm -hmm. syrup that's. Uh, that's down on the bottom. So you take all the leaves out and put them up. And you just let that portion evaporate, evaporate. And then later on, maybe a couple of days later, it turns into like a Jolly Rancher candy. That's how it hardens up. So all you do after that is you add water back to it when you want to use it. And it goes on very, very, very light. Uh, you know, uh, like a, loud, a very light loud brown, brownish, brownish of color uh, I want to say like the, the background of the chair right here that's the color of it before it's fired after it's fired is that's when the the slip and the the paint come together chemically wise at a certain at a certain stage of uh, the heat that turns it black right now I you know I've been told that there is a lot of variation in the, the shades of black and that can depend on how old the plant is, uh, what the season of the year is when you harvest it, uh -huh. what kind of soil it's grown in, how much rain we've had. And so, you know, when you look at the black on Native American uh, pottery, the black can sometimes look very brown all the way to the blackest black you can imagine, uh, like Thomas's black. Uh, because of the variation in that wild spinach. I've heard it called bee weed. Uh, I've heard it called honey plant. I right. know that the bees really like it, and maybe that's why um, it's called honey plant. But, um, yeah, it just grows wild all over the state of New Mexico. Yes, it grows during the springtime. Mm -hmm. Springtime and in the late spring, it, it blooms, it blooms, there's a pop, purple, purple bloom on top of it. And, you know, some people say, take that off and just use the plants and use the roots. With my experience with the, the, how my black gets really black is I completely use the whole plant, the leaves and all the, even the bloom. So that's what... Uh, so there's my little secret. I use the whole plant uh -oh, instead of, you just instead told of using it. just. Some people say do you just use the, uh, the, uh, the 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 leaves and sometimes just the stem itself. Me, I put the whole thing. We put the whole thing in. We put the whole thing, and that's why I believe my 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 black is black. Yeah, because people were other. Other uh, artists, other potters were asking me how my black is so black. I said, I used the whole plant. I no. said, I used the whole plant. So it's all experiment. Because one time I just used the, the leaves. I cut all the, I, I put the, uh, I took the flower off and said, and nope, it didn't work that well. Yeah, so it's all experimental. And it's, most of it I, I get just driving along the, on the roads, on the reservation, and it's on the side. Right. Just pick them easy. Maybe get a lawnmower and no, I'm just kidding. You mean maybe, <laughs> no. maybe it's a weed. Yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. But that, that plant is edible. Yeah, as a matter of fact, yes, yes, we do. Mm -hmm. we, we, we eat it. We eat it. It's a, a wild spinach. It's, it's really and good. Lots of iron. Lots of iron. Yeah, it's like you said, the iron oxide. It's, 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 that's the main, main thing, right? Okay, we got it to this stage. I'm trying to keep it evenly. I hope that that answered the question for the 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 person who asked it. Oh, right. We answered the, we answered the, the question. If not, you know, if, if you need more information or would like us to go a little deeper, yes, or please. or if the explanation was far too long, uh, you can let yeah. us know and we'll go from there. So yep. I also have another question from Sue, and she is wondering how thick the base is, uh, like the thickness of the clay towards the base. Okay. What? Uh, yes, yeah, she. I don't know if Sue was around when we first started from the base, 
but I'll give her a little example how thick it is. You see, I got, it's about, say about that thick. So now this is gonna shrink a little more and then after it dries, we're gonna have to sand some of it off. So I say half, a, half of what, I, what you see right here. So like a piece of cardboard? Right, 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 there mm -hmm. you go. There you go. Also, Thomas, you make such big pots. If you had your clay much thicker than that, no one would ever be able to move it. You need a crane. <laughs> yes, yes. I remember when I first started doing those big pots. It's, that's when I started teaching myself to thin my layers out because I remember one time I set a pot down and that was one of the first few I made and it was really hard to, 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 get, to pick, it, pick it back up. And plus, everything is fired upside down and that the pot itself has to carry its own weight during the firing. So if there's too much weight up here, you're gonna crack the rim during the firing stage. And that's what I've learned, also learned, is you have to go evenly all the way around. If you don't, if you, if you don't, you're gonna, you're gonna see some, uh, you're gonna see some hard times <laughs> with, with, with uh, well, the drawing a, stage. Well, a lot of wasted time. A lot of wasted time. Because you don't yeah. get any product at the end. You know what, that's one thing I've, I've, uh, one thing I really taught myself is not to do the same thing uh, if there's a mistake, man. And I'm still learning now. I'm still learning. Where was Sue from? Where is she, she was asking us she questions. She didn't say. Oh, okay. So hopefully I, we answered Sue, but, uh, No, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your gallery, Andrea, if I can. <laughs> yeah, sure you can. Yes. Well, I just, I, I just want to thank, thank you and uh, the family, Derek, and all, and all your employees that have been here, worked here for years. Uh, you know, Andrea has really put me on the map uh, when I first started potty. I remember, I believe she was down here. At yeah, down point. the street. Yeah, and uh, those those were my difficult times uh, during those times, you know, uh, with uh, alcohol abuse, drug abuse. But we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> but anyways, I, I I remember walking in and sh she bought a piece from me, and and uh, you know I never did bother her again till maybe like a year or a couple of years later because my cousin she works at one of these stores and she came came to me and said. Uh, Andrea was asking for you, do you know her? And I said, Andrea who? You sold her a pot, a, a bowl. And I said, oh yeah. I said, what's wrong with the bowl? I go, <laughs> <laughs> no, she wants another one. I think she sold it that afternoon when you brought her. Oh, I thought I'd done something wrong. <laughs> well, anyways, uh, ever since then, that was, I don't even remember what year that was. Well, we've been in this location now. How long, Derek? 17 years? 2001. 2001, 19 2000. years. That must have been. So I've known you that for t almost 20 years. Yeah, that Our, was that last year you were over down uh -huh. here. Yeah. Well, any, anyways, I just want to thank you because I really, I really. Oh, how sweet, Tom. You, you put thank me you. on the map. I, I, I'll, I'll say this. I'll say it for that much. And uh, I remember uh, back in 2009, uh, the tribe, uh, the tribe's governor got invited. To, uh, to Washington, D.C., so uh, they asked me to come along, and I said, sure. They said, well, why don't you bring a piece so we can give it as a gift to the White House? And I said, wow, we don't have no piece. I don't have no pieces at home. So anyways, well, so I can go to Sanford to Andreas and get one over there, and we'll give it to uh, 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 Obama's administration. They said, all right. And so, so I came up here and we packed one up and we we took it to the to the White House. Uh, the governor went and took took it to the White House. I didn't have a security clearance because they asked me like uh, real fast to go. So, anyways, it's 
it's in the White House, and so you yeah. know, we mentioned your name, my name, the tribe's name. So it's we're all getting represented over there. I, and I know they're going to keep it, keep it in the archives over there, so it's going to stay per permanently yeah. within the White House archives. So that's one thing about Andrea. She, you know, she put me in the map, on the map of pottery. You know, I mean, there's no other place I would love to have my stuff in Santa Fe, other than the museum shops. You know, I, you know, but uh, we've we've uh, what? we we've stuck together for a yeah. long time. Yeah. Well, you know, Thomas, there are many museums that we have sold your pieces too. Right, uh -huh. right. Just last a couple of years ago. The Crocker Museum the Crocker in, uh, in Sacramento. Sacramento. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, I we have stuff. Uh, I remember us selling some people to the Prince of Singapore or something from here. The Rockefellers. The, the Rockefellers. Rockefeller uh huh. Right. Uh, who else do I remember? Uh, well, Scott, Scott, the guy that works back there. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who do I? Say? Who else do I remember? There's some of the Smithsonian, of course, in D.C. Well, the John John D. I guess that's John D. Um, Rockefeller was our first customer when we opened this gallery, uh -huh. and, and he bought one of your pieces. Which, and you know, he died not long after that. But he was, you know, that great collector in the family, and you know, it was really, it's really been interesting to uh, deal with. Um, all kinds of people from right. all over the world. And, and the one thing, you know, they can relate to more than anything is the fact that um, we are so lucky in this country to have our own indigenous people. Their culture is still alive and yes. all the beautiful things that they made for themselves, they now make for us as well. And which is really, really quite wonderful. But Thomas, thank you. I yes, mean, it's yes. been a pleasure. We've done a lot of crazy things together over the years, haven't we? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we've, we've, uh, I like going to your house on special occasions, having a dinner with your family, friends, and all. Yeah, we, we, we've done some firings at your house. Uh, uh, but, uh, I'm still waiting to get married, so you can't come to my wedding. <laughs> 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 but uh, yes, we 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 had a, have a lot of fun, and you know the, I guess the most important thing you know as an artist as a potter, you know, Andrea has been very very supportive, and like she said earlier, we got paid for how our house, our cars, and so on, you know, and Andrea has been very fair fair. She's she's fair with the prices that you know so we don't. You know, sometimes we make the offer, but most of the time, we know what. She knows the quality of the pots, and she knows what uh, she's going to pay me, and I, I, I'm, per, I'm satisfied. I've, I've always been satisfied. I've never had a difficult time. So that's the reason I have, most of my stuff in Santa Fe is here. Where in, did in I go store. wrong? Yeah. Oh, I, my I, goodness. I, <laughs> I, 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 Every time uh, your, your arm's probably all twisted. Yeah, your arm's all twist your twisted arm. up. <laughs> well, Thomas, those yeah. are, I think those are very kind words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you talk to other potters, you know, I mean, you know, I know, ever since I've been potting, you know, I've, I've, you know I, I talk to other potters from other villages and they say the same thing. And look at the quality. I mean, even in magazines and in, in, in any stuff, uh, you know, reviews of some sort, you know, you know, you're, if you ever go to San Fe, come to Andreas, you're going to find the quality. And the people that work here, they know what they're talking about. They know how to explain what village it's from, what, how it's made, what it's used for, what not to do. You, they'll teach you how to clean it and how to dust it off, you know. So that's, that's, that's why people come here. I'm not trying to do a commercial for them. It's just the truth. Sure sounds like it, and yeah, you know yeah, what? It's yeah, your yeah. son's great. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you can get you can give me the twenty bucks later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very it's very true. It's very true. I've got a I've got a couple of uh, students, which is my granddaughter, and uh, I've got a friend of mine that works along with me, Franklin. So Franklin's uh, starting to get his stuff in here. Uh, Right now he's working on some other stuff, but uh, me and him, 
help each other get, gather the clay, our firing, and uh, and some other stuff. He's a he's a real good friend of mine. And, Is uh, he related? We have no relation. Maybe somewhere down the line, but not nothing. But immediate. you have the same last name. There's a lot of Tenorius in here. Robert, you know. Are you, uh, are you related so, to Robert? No, nowhere close. Huh. Nowhere close. Yeah, nowhere any, anything close. But maybe somebody down the line, or maybe there's a, maybe there's just a Tenoria is just common as a Smith Jones, you know, in yeah. from my pueblo. Yeah. Well, if you go to Santa Clara pueblo. Probably a third of the people there have the last name of Naranjo, and the other third have the last name of Tafoya, and the other third are all the other names that exist in the Pueblo. And, and oftentimes you can tell what Pueblo people are from by um, their last name, which is something the Spaniards uh, adopted when they showed up along with naming the Pueblos, because, uh, you know, Catholicism sort of required you to have a family name as well as a first name. And, and also, uh, they used Catholicism to honor the saints in their religion and by uh, naming the villages, the Native American villages that uh, uh, they conquered. I hate using that word. But yeah, 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 yeah. Colonization but those days or whatever are, you those want to call Those days are over. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a history buff, so uh, you know, pretty much I I I know what's went around here, and I I didn't even I hear it through the stories of the elders at home, you know. But once you start reading in the archives of you know the Spanish, uh, uh, the the priest, the the, the Catholic. Uh, you know, because they kept everything in records. So if oh, really, they were yeah. incredible record yes, keepers. Yes, yes. I mean, they didn't do a lot with like birth certificates. Right. But what they did was a sacrament date. So, you know, when you were baptized and when you were confirmed and when you were married, all those are, are part of, and when you died too, all of those are all part of their records. It's just they weren't so good about when... Uh, uh, children were born. Uh huh. But you can imagine that you know if there was a circuit priest or a priest that was in a church in in one of the the pueblos, that uh, you could sort of figure out there was maybe a five year leeway f uh, for births because, um, you know the the you were, they would baptize you relatively early if there was uh, a priest on duty or if it was a circuit priest. The, the circuit priests right. would get around to the smaller villages at least once every five years um, because, you know, New Mexico is pretty rugged territory with, with all the mountains and traveling wasn't very easy then. So, uh, yeah, uh, well, to, to, yeah. this, to this day, there's a, you know, a couple of priests that still circulate within the neighborhood in Pueblos. You know, uh -huh. we don't have a tournament priest there, so there's one that c comes and then goes to the next village at a certain time on Sundays mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to, to do the sermon there and so on. But now it's easier. You just jump in your car rather than walking. That's true. That's <laughs> true. That's true. Yeah. So anyways, I'm at that stage to where I'm putting the, the coil that I put, put in last. I'm putting it together to where we can start uh, start shaping it. That part of the coil, you make sure it comes together. I make it, sh make sure it comes together because if there's going to be a crack that's normally right there, why? Because the plastic in this area, it's going to be more moist over here, right? So once it gets a little more drier, I pull the plastic out a little. That way it can dry evenly. But once the base gets really sturdy enough, I take it out right away. That way you can dry evenly more. Mm. I know but, some of their, the potters dry their pots after they get to a certain stage upside down. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can do that. You can do that. Uh, I, I do that myself with smaller pieces. But with the bigger pieces, I just don't trust it because it's too much weight on here, on top, I mean, on the bottom. Once you put it down, 
the, the rim gets really, really fragile. So sometimes when I put the last coil on a huge pot, I make it extra thicker, extra thicker. That way, if that pot's going to be used, you're always going to be hitting something against here. So you don't want it to start um, wearing out too fast. So that's what I see with the older pots. The, the ones that they were using, they're pretty, they're pretty worn out on top because mm -hmm. you're going to put, start putting a, a, a gore of, uh, or water or something. You're handling always on the top. Yeah. So, uh, so I try to uh, make, it a, make it a little thicker. So, so at Santa Domingo, uh, what do they use pots for? Basically everything. Or what, no, what, what, they, what did they use? Pots for? They use that for mostly for uh, uh, the huge ones. So we're going to start with the, with the huge we'll work ones. Work our way down? Yeah, we'll yeah. work our way down. The, the huge storage, that's why they call it storage jars. Because they store it uh, during the winter time or harvest time, the corn, weed, and so on, flour within the, those, those pots. I grew up right next door to a family that owned uh, uh, a grocery, a small grocery store. Grocery store, a little uh, a trade, trade place. So when I was growing up, you know, I would go into their house and they had huge, huge storage just, I guess because uh, the grandpa used to barter with, the, the, with, the, with all the potters around San Domingo for groceries and stuff. So he accumulated a lot of those storage chests, which they were being used. They, were, they stored uh, corn and flour, especially flour in those. And uh, sometimes they used to, they stored uh, uh, different kind of feathers in those big storage jars. I just learned this by reading, especially, especially, uh, uh, Birds from uh, from South America, South America, uh, Central America. They they stored the feathers in there. Why? Because they kept it. It's almost the 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 the, the same degrees as the 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 rain the rainforest of inside a pot stored in the in a cool place. So that kept the feathers from uh, you know getting uh, bad and stuff. So that's what I've learned. I read about hey, that. What, what kind of feathers do they store? Uh, they're, they're different kind of feathers. So, you know, different different kind of feathers. Uh, you know, I won't go into detail with that. Yeah. Yeah, they're different and, kind of feathers. And they would use the feathers? Yeah, for, for us, uh, dancing and stuff uh -huh. like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so any, anyways, so they use the big, the big storage jars for, for, the, for that main pur purpose. And then, so... You go a little smaller, which are the water jars. And that's what they use to store water in at home for uses. Because, you know, back in the day, I, I, I seen that era where there was no plumbing in the 60s. I, I, I was born in the 60s. And not too many people, uh, you know, had uh, bad bathrooms when I was grow, growing up. So the, wow. so the, the plumbing, plumbing was there, but they still... They still used uh, the water from uh, the ditch or from the river. So the medium, medium pots are basically were for, for water usage. But you don't put water in pots today. Uh, I mean, you can still, I, 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 I tell, my, tell my customers, I say, it's meant to be used, but if you're going to pay that, much, that kind of money, I would, I would put water in it. But then again, they still use them at home, yeah. you know. Especially, let's go with the, the bowls. The bowls, like uh, I think we have a couple over there. You know, they used uh, use it for uh, utilitary reasons for to eat from and stuff like that. You know, because that's a what to mix to to mix. Uh, oh, like, there like you go, bread adobo, dough. adobo, yeah. where uh -huh. they still mix the with with the dough. And I tell my fr people too, I say this is called a dough bowl, but I don't know if you want to mix your dough in here, you know. Yeah, but right. They, unless some, unless you have lots of dough. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I seen some some people still using it at home, the dough bowls, and you okay. can see see from the the the, the what's it called, the pitana, or when, when it gets older, you know, the the, the patina, the, the patina, the patina. Uh -huh. There you go. Yeah, I mean, after choosing it, and 
handle it with your hands and it's got this glazy looking look, yeah. look on it yeah. to where you know all the all the, the the oils from your hands and so on different and it gives that uh it give it gives it a, like a, a seal of some sort uh -huh. you know i like those kind of uh the bowls that's that those are really in really interesting ones so we have another question from Sue, and she's from Pennsylvania, by the oh, way. Oh! Wow. Um, and she is wondering if there's any kind of sap or, or material that is used on the bowls to make them waterproof. Ah, uh, do you know what? Uh, during, during, during my research, during my research of Santa Domingo Pottery, I'm not talking about anybody else pottery, but I'm talking about Santa Domingo Pottery, is this clay is so tough. I'm telling you, even without it being fired, it is, it dries like a rock. Yeah, it it's dries dense. Like a rock. Yes, it's, it's pretty dense. But I believe the white slip, the white slip gives it that waterproof proof, proof it on it. That's why you see a lot of uh, the, the old pots that that uh, they, they use for the water storage. You can see this white painted on, on there. But if you, don't, if you don't paint it on there, you, to, you have to, the redness of the clay. But I've done a couple of pots for, for some people that were gonna use it. So I said, I'm gonna have to paint it inside the, the white slit. And there's not gonna be no design. And sure enough, we well, got waterproof. For so, anyone who's watching, Never, ever, ever use any of these pieces. If you need a bowl, go to Walmart and <laughs> buy a nice stainless steel bowl. If you need a flower vase, well, wherever you buy flower vases at the florist or even at, at Walmart or Target, go, go there and get a flower vase because there is the chance that the piece uh, w the water will leach through the piece, the slip may crackle off, mm -hmm. uh, the pot may be destroyed if it's not fired highly, high enough, high, high temperature enough. Mm -hmm. And besides, you know, a, a nice stainless steel bowl to, use, to be utilitarian may cost you $10 at the most, mm -hmm. but many of these Native American pieces are really just a piece of art and they cost a whole lot more than that ten dollar uh, stainless steel bowl so you know talking about having the people at the pueblo use it for their day-to-day -day, uh, their day-to-day -day, uh, purposes uh, is really different than someone who buys one of these pieces of art because right. they can make another one. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I was going to yeah, say. That's what can, I was going to yeah, say. Thomas, if Thomas <laughs> uses it and, and it falls apart because of the water right. uh, and, and destroys the piece of furniture underneath that it was sitting on, mm -hmm. he can make another one, but most other people can't. So. Uh, use them as decorative objects only, and uh, and if you know the Pueblo people want to use them, that's that's another whole story. Anyway, uh, so let me. Thomas, I have another question for you from Cherry Johnson. She's from Williamsburg, Virginia, and she noticed a little white line on the rim of each of your pots. What is it for? Are uh, you mean the finished ones? The. I'm sure she does. Uh, Oh, we're talking about the. Uh -huh. oh, she's talking. Oh, yes, that there is the the brick. That's the last last line I put in after I decorate the pot itself. And they they call that the the exit of life, the spiritual path of 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 uh, of the pot itself. You don't want to lock anything in within the uh, within the pot. So. You've got all this energy that has to come out somehow. So that's the breakage. Positive energy, goodwill energy, and the energy of the pot itself. So that's yeah. the exit door. That, that's the exit door, yes. That's the exit mm -hmm. door. Every one of my pots, or every one of Santo Domingo 
Kochiri, and I believe uh, Santa Anna has this breakage breakage on each part. It's just it's just a traditional thing. It's a traditional thing, and I. Uh, so it's intentional. Yes, it's intentional. It's intentional. It's intention. It's it means something. It means something, you know. And uh, you know, I if. I've never seen a part from, from my Pueblo that didn't have that, break, break, that breakage. Yes. So that's what it means. Uh, who is it? Sue? Not Sue? No, not Sue. This was... This was Carrie. Oh, Carrie. Carrie. Williamsburg, Virginia. Okay, Carrie. I hope I answered your question. But uh, if you ever find a one from Santa Domingo that don't have that breakage, get it. There's going to be a collector. <laughs> also, you got, yes. you got an aloha from Hawaii. Oh, okay. Well, some even the 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 the, the uh, car the, the rug makers from uh, uh, Navajo Navajo Reservation they uh, they have a breakage in in, mm -hmm. in their rugs. They also. call it a spirit line. They call it a spirit uh -huh. line, and oh. it goes and there is some part of the rug where that color goes all the way to the edge. Even if there's a border uh -huh. uh, of a different color, it goes all the way to the edge to release oh. the all the energy that Spider Woman put oh, into the making of that rug. Well, see, I learned something new today. I forgot once something I didn't bring from home. What do you need? I need like a little sharp knife of some sort, but I'll use... Do we have a little sharp knife? I'm trying to take the excess of the plastic off. Oh, uh, oh, as close to the pot as I can. Oh, uh, yeah. So I normally, I normally have a blade, or maybe a blade of some sort. Uh, do, so, do the scissors work? Um, it's not really that close, but it's 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 gonna do. It's gonna do. So sometimes I don't make these plastics too big. I try to keep it the same size, but this is uh, this is gonna be okay. Ah. Hey Thomas. Yes. We're done with that. Uh, we just got a question. Uh, if you can tell about some of the designs that you use on some of your pots and the figures oh, the, that you use on your pots. Oh, the finished would this, ones. Would this be a good time to? Go over to sure. the yes, yes. Yeah. This, is a, this is a good time. Let me go ahead and give Just me a give me a, a minute because I'm gonna do this. That way you can start drawing. As you can see, the bottom of this is coming. Oh, I'm not gonna need it no more. I, I used oh. Well, anyways, I think when I first started, my table was 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 uneven. That's why my pots were like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had an old counter when potters would come in and they would bring their pots uh -huh. and would place them on the old counter. And we'd look at some of those pots and say, boy, they're really crooked. And it wasn't the pot at all. It was the counter. It, yeah, sometimes, yeah. That's what I do. Okay. Once I get to this stage, I take off a little of it. That way, I, the next coil is going to go on there evenly. Now, as you can see, this is handmade. <laughs> it's no, there's no will involved. I mean, not a wheel. I'm still alive. <laughs> not that kind of wheel. Okay. There we go. Not a wheel. <laughs> not a wheel, wheel, wheel. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, kids. I'm still kicking. Okay. See how it is. Now it's ready for the next one. Boom, boom, boom. As, it, as you go on, it's, it's, the steps, the pot itself is going to start coming out the way it wants to. It's not me. It's this it's the pop. Okay, let's go to the Okay.
Thomas, yesterday, Ruby was here and she said because of uh, the pottery work she does, she doesn't have any fingerprints. Do you have fingerprints? Oh, you mean right. Some, uh -huh. Sometimes, especially when I'm sanding, all these ones go out and then after a few, after a few days, you got to let your skin come back because it's really sensitive when you touch something, yeah, especially during the sanding stage. Well, That's where my problem is. Well, Ruby is. and I were planning on to rob a bank. Oh, if you'd like to come and join us, that way there wouldn't be any uh, uh, fingerprint evidence. Uh, I, uh, my, my mug shut all over, so they don't catch me. Let <laughs> <laughs> me put my shoes on. You put your shoes on. Yeah, it's comfortable. But do you have to wipe them back up? This is Sue again. Oh, Sue. I like Sue. She, was, she asks good questions. So what, what designs would you like to tell us about? Okay. Uh, I'm going to start with this. Go from the bottom. Well, which one she's asking about? She okay. just wants to know a general idea of design. Okay. Well, let's go over here first. This is... This is a very traditional sensitive to pop. Where I come from, we're limited in doing some sort of, uh, you know, sacred designs and stuff. So, in sensitive to pottery, you're going to see a lot of uh, birds and flowers. I've kind of went a little, little contemporary. As you can see this, I call this uh, the, the night, or, night, night or day pot, or either I call it, either I call it the moon and sun, sun, one or the other. But this design has been around for a long time. And everybody thinks, everybody thinks this is very contemporary, temp, contemporary. The only reason you think it's contemporary is because nobody's been doing it. This, this design comes back from the late 1920s, uh, the 30s. So I started redoing it. The pot right next to it is called the negative pot, uh, where there's only a few white areas that you could, could see. I, I started doing some new designs. This one up here, I call that lightning. I call that lightning, uh, as you can see, See, you see, but there's back in the in the uh, Chaco Canyon, uh, Mesa Verde times, they were doing a lot of that design. Uh, we have a lot of uh, the chili bowls, chili bowls, and they, they're these are all fired outside. And like we were talking earlier, Andre, you know, they still use these at home for uh, utilitarian reasons, uh, eating from there, or you know serving food. Uh, the frog I did uh, for, uh, there's a new hotel that opened up in uh, Albuquerque. It's called the Chaco Hotel. Anyways, they found this certain frog uh, up there made uh, in uh, Chaco Canyon. So that's their symbol. So, you know, I, I, I did one. I used to do a lot of tiny stuff. This is sitting around just you know practicing painting doing little stuff but uh i like doing this and also you could do this and just make it around uh let's see this certain one the, the, this is a bowl that meant to be be used for certain certain stuff but this design you that's a plant and a butterfly in it. This is an old design dating back uh, into uh, the, the early uh, uh, 1920s. I got this from uh, the book, uh, Chapman book. So Thomas, while you're on designs, okay. I'm gonna show a picture to the camera real quick. Okay. Which is right here. 
Right. And now I'm going to show it to you. Okay. And the, the gentleman asks, uh, in 2016, Thomas made a jar for me with a butterfly design on one side. Right. The attached sh side shows the reverse side of the pop. Is this also a Kiwa butterfly design, or does it represent something else? And this comes from Daniel from the San Diego area. Okay, Daniel. You're exactly right. I, you remember right. It is a butterfly. It is also a butterfly. butterfly. It's almost the same as the one I just showed you before. Just a little changes here and there. Put a little, little of my own, own design in there. Well, let's see, do we have another butterfly? This one, here's another butterfly. Uh, I just brought this in today. As you can see, that's also a butterfly. And we have four butterflies on the side. And this, these are, this design is, we call those clouds. Well, Daniel, I hope that answers your question. And if you have more, don't hesitate to email us. Okay, this is my newest one. This is my newest one. These, I, I call this pot as, as a cloud pot. Because we have clouds here, we have clouds here, we also have clouds here. More of the round clouds are summer clouds. And then the, you know, summer cloud, these are more of winter clouds that they're blowing. These, I call those raindrops, either raindrop or, or snow, or snow drops. As you can see, that's a regular Santa Domingo design on there. I'm not sure what this one's called, but this is a very old design. Very old design there. Oh. Now this one here, I like, I like doing dots. And I came up with, uh, I came up with uh, this certain pop. I, I, I started doing this maybe a couple of years ago. I challenged myself on these two pops where I could build it coming in to where it doesn't collapse on me. So this, this, these two pops are really, really hard and I love it. I love doing that. So Thomas, I have right. another question for sure. you. This comes from Catherine, and if you want to just take this pot real quick. Okay. And Catherine would like to know what the designs are on this piece, and she just purchased it. Okay. Thank you, Catherine, for purchasing this. This here, I call this a tulip. A tulip. The hummingbirds around it, I just started doing the hummingbirds, uh, I think, this year. This year, I think, I, ha I haven't done hummingbirds, but I was uh, talking to one of my friends and she was telling me, I said, why don't you do a hummingbird? I said, because I was, I was doing a lot of butterflies and dragonflies. So I believe you, this is the first one, first hummingbird that we've sold here. I, 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 I think, I, I strongly think I, this is the first one. And as you can see, these are all the different kind of vegetation that I see around in Santo Domingo. Different kind, different stuff, but the leaves here are traditional uh, designs that you'll see in other older, older Santo Domingo Pueblo pots. And this is called the cylinder base. I believe I started doing these a couple of years ago and I I'm really having fun with these. And uh, I was explaining to one of my friends that bought one too, if you want to put, she wanted to put flowers in there and I said, yes, but make sure you put something else in here with the water and you can display your flowers in this. But this is a very nice piece and uh, the firing went well on this. So thank you for purchasing. Is it Karen? Catherine. 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 Thank you. Where is she from? Where is this going to? I don't know. Where is she? Uh, 
Not sure at the moment. Not sure? Okay. All right, Captain. Oh, let me one more thing. As you can see on top, you know, just this is, I believe this is kind of my signature, the dots on it. I just put, put it there to where, you know, one of these days my grandkids, my great grandkids are going to see this and they say, they're going to see it and they're going to say, that's, that's my grandpa's work. This is my grandpa's work. Oh, on top, just a little more old sense of the window design. Thank you for purchasing that. Okay. Let's see what else we have. What about the frog? The frog? Yeah, I think I explained the frog about. Like I said, uh, I did this. I did this design for a Chaco Chaco Hotel. With the new 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 hotel in Old Town in Albuquerque, this is their symbol. So when you walk into the into the hotel there, there's a there's a, a huge paw. I believe it's like 26 inches that are sitting on top. Uh, I have three of them, and they have one Acoma pop. So uh, so I did that a couple of years ago. So this is just this is the symbol. This is their symbol, and this. Certain thing, the certain uh, frog was found up in Chaco Canyon. It was made out of a black jade and inlaid with, with a turquoise. Yeah, so that's where that design comes from. It, then it has the cloud design, vegetation from the Pueblo. So Thomas, uh, from I, what I understand about Tom, uh, Santa Domingo pieces is the birds and the animals are always indescript animals it's never a specific type of bird right it's always just bird as a general why is that it's it's uh i i i well from from from, from what i understand is there's there's different kind of different kind of birds right but when you put it all together it's just one one simple uh, a spiritual being which is a bird so all one bird symbolizes everything if I if I can make it very simple, that works. Yes. yes. Yeah, I'm all good. I'm all for simple. You're right. You're right. We don't have to be uh, doing doing this and this and there. So uh, let's see which one we're gonna do. Oh, this is the new thing too. Even the shape to this. I love this. I love this. The the one we sold, the hummingbird. That was the first piece and. I believe this is the second hummingbird. This here represents uh, the cotton plant. The cotton, C-O-T-T-O-N, all right? So, I, just, I, said, I said to myself, I said, we're gonna put something else in there. So I said, let's try it with the, with the hummingbirds. So I got several hummingbirds in here. I had another piece that did that didn't make it because I had 16 hummingbirds flying all around but this one has four pieces and this is a different different kind of thing as you can see it on the outside too the firing went well on this one this is the wind blowing right here mm -hmm. the wind blowing there so this one is the first piece I never done before this is the very very first in the oval shape so catherine by the way is from tucson arizona uh-huh tucson arizona mm -hmm. all right cat catherine catherine. catherine catherine enjoy that piece i get a get a turntable like that so you can see it all so the hummingbirds can fly around <laughs> oh okay the plates we forgot to do the plate the plate. Now these ones, these are my, I'm gonna sell my sellers because once you put this on a, on an easel, you can easily show this in any room, like the one we have over there with the bird. We've always had these in the galleries because you can always put it on an easel and it doesn't take much room up. Like with that that uh, that particular pop there. Mm. So uh, we have another question.
question from Terry. Sure. Terry is, oh, excuse me, this is it's from Carol. Carol asks, sometimes the white slip is very white, and other right. times the white slip is very gray. And okay. why does that happen? That is during the firing stage. These one, this one you can tell. This one's fired during the during the uh, summer months. Summer months when it's really, really hot. I think I fired this one uh, last month sometime. These ones, you can see the grayish, the grayish tone tone on it is because it was fired during the winter time where the temperature doesn't really reach high enough to do that. But this is all outside fire, so you never know what's going to come out. It's uh, it's never a guarantee that it will survive uh, outside fire. Does that explain it? Good I enough? think so. Yes. So the more the more grayish tone you see on here is because the it was either it didn't reach the temperature, or or the firing was low, or the humidity. If there's the, there was humid. So I've been getting a lot of this grayish on on my pots lately for the past two weeks because it's been really raining in Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo, I have no I I have no problem with the rain and stuff. Uh, yeah, I'll just wait on a certain day to fire it. Yeah. Does that explain it? Yep. If okay. if anybody else out there has any other questions for Thomas, they may email them to us. They may ask them on YouTube, on the YouTube chat. They can also text them to us at the phone number that is below. I, re I remember uh, one summer we had 77, no, we sold 77 pieces within the Indian market, uh, Indian market, uh, during the market in this gallery and plus I have a booth of my own so I think we had 77 pieces all together so that was that was a that was a crazy time we're bringing them in and getting them out all right okay. Thomas do you want to head back over to do some demonstration or do um, you want to keep talking about some of these designs if, if anybody has any other questions we can uh, we can uh, answer more questions uh, and take a little break from doing that. Yeah. Oh, we just got another one. Uh, do the flames touch the pot, or are they covered by shards or metal or uh, something else? This is from Sue again. Oh, Sue, good question. Great, great question. I like that question. Back in the day, they used to use uh, powder fry shards to, to cover it. To cover it uh, Nowadays, uh, uh, I use an old melt crate, old metal, metal melt crate, where you can put it on a, over the pot, but you still have, 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 have the fuel, fuel go in, but not touching the pot. So, so uh, either, either I make a, a, a cage of some sort, Cause if it touches, if it touches the pot, if it touches the pot, the fuel, it's gonna stay on there. And there's no way to get in there to throw that piece of piece of wood off or a piece of uh, fuel off. So it's gonna stay on there, and then you lose, you lose a mark. So you want something, something protected it from from uh, from uh, from touching the pot. Because I'm doing it the old way, the way they did it in Chaco Canyon and. Uh, the Mesa Verde area is a, just an open flame. We don't, we, there's no manure or anything. This is just uh, either cedar, cedar wood or cottonwood bark that's, uh, that's, uh, that I use to fuel. Yes. So uh, there is a cage. It doesn't, it, it doesn't touch uh, the pot. But sometimes it does. Sometimes, uh, sometimes a little branch will get in there and let me show you the inside of the pot. Okay. I don't know if you can see in here. Can we see in there? Oh. Okay, there we go. I think we can. Anyways, if you want to really know if it's been fired outside, 
It always leaves some marks of of black in here. So if 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 any time you want to know if it's been fired outside, because some some of these pots they think uh, some people think that I fire in a kiln, and which is like for for instance that pot there that came up so so white. So they think I fired in a kiln, but when once you look inside, you're gonna see a bunch of a uh, bunch of uh, black marks here and there, because every every one of my pots are fired upside down so because you want to track you want to get the heat from the outside and also you want to trap the heat inside that way you, your firing is going evenly evenly that way you've got two 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 sides uh, firing at the same time so that's the reason that's the reason I do it that way. I don't know about any any other people that fire their 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 pumps sitting this way because if you see if you sit if you fire a pump sitting up straight, once the fire fire starts going, the embers start falling and they start landing here and there. So that's gonna give, give you a bunch of marks here and there. So so that's the reason. Uh, two also is that I fire them upside down, if that makes any sense. Cool. Okay. Where's the other pot? Is this it? I this thought I it? <laughs> okay, let me go back over there. I'm gonna take a quick break. Yeah, okay. no problem. Okay. Well, we're gonna switch to Andrea. Hold on just one second. Okay. Folks, welcome back. Let me put my mask on so I don't infect anyone out there. Uh, anyway, um, Thomas is going to take a little bit of a break now. But while he is indisposed, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what, what we're going to be doing in the next few days. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be um, having a demonstration for Hebert Candelaria. And Hubert is from San Felipe Pueblo. And Derek, if I could have one of the brochures, that would be wonderful. And what I did is I brought one of Hubert's pieces so that you could see it, uh, which is really, really quite remarkable, how he's able to make these pots. You know, when Thomas was talking about the clay and how difficult it is to have it dry evenly and and how fragile it is in some ways because of the shrinkage that how Hubert is able to make this um, this type of pottery is really remarkable and you know when he first brought in one of these holy holy pots uh, I said to him Hubert how about at like a 50% discount for me because I'm only getting half a pot and uh, of course that didn't work at all because he said that he makes 10 of them before he can get one to survive so Hubert will be here tomorrow and uh, from our little brochure I'm sure you've got one of these in the mail or at least seen it online Derek did a great job of all the designs and colors I think and then on Friday, we're having Paula Estevan and Robert Cassero. Paula is from Acoma Pueblo. Robert is from Laguna. They are partners. Uh, they do not collaborate. Paula makes her own pieces and paints her own pieces. And the same thing is true of Robert, because sometimes partners do collaborate where one does one part of the process and the other, the other half. And, uh, but with Paula and Robert, um, they are each separate. And what's really nice is that Paula met Robert, and Robert didn't know how to make pottery, 
and she taught him how to do to do it and um, he has really really excelled and on Saturday uh, uh, Francis and Marvin Martinez will be uh, the potters that we have they do collaborate Francis makes the pots and Marvin does the design work the the painting of the pots that is really typical when a husband and wife work together uh, where the, the, the female role, the gender specific role is the, the, the woman makes the pieces of pottery. There are very, very few men who uh, in the past who would be involved in pottery making other than doing the decorating. And Marvin is the great grandson of the very famous Maria Martinez from San Ildefonso Pueblo. And um, Marvin, I'm sure, was alive uh, before Maria died. And maybe he'll have a few stories about uh, Maria. Re Marvin was raised by Santan and, and Adam. And Adam is Maria's oldest son. And I'm sure that we'll hear a few things about Santana and Adam as well on Saturday. And that sort of concludes this week. Next week we start up again on Tuesday. And again, Tuesday through Saturday. Uh, if you look on our website, there are specific times. There aren't any in the brochure because we really didn't have those specific times uh, when we first started out because there are so many restrictions with the Pueblos and as to when they can leave and what they do when they leave and the times that they can be gone that we were afraid to publish anything and not then be able to keep our word. So look on the website and you'll be able to uh, figure out uh, when you can tune in. And again, you know, ask us lots of questions because we really want to know what you want to know and make sure that you get correct information so we can continue on our quest to um, educate the public as much as possible, to, mainly to keep this wonderful craft alive forever. Uh, we don't want, I mean, we really worry about the fact that many of the Native American artists who desperately need the income and do not have venues like um, Indian Market and all the various museum shows that are put on during the year to have an income. We don't want them heading off to be a greeter at Walmart. Uh, instead, we'd rather have them stick to this wonderful traditional work that, um, that they have been doing for decades. <coughs> Uh, Thomas isn't quite ready to come back yet, but as, as soon as he is, uh, we will continue on with his pieces. You know, the reason that we're doing all of this is so that the potters have an opportunity to um, earn some money over Indian Market, and there really isn't uh, many other venues uh, for them to do so. But uh, Thomas is now back to, uh, in his place, hooking up his mic, and uh, we will continue on from there. And I think one of the things that Thomas wants to talk about while he's rolling out the next uh, few coils is that the gazillion, and we, you know, we measure the awards he's received in poundage uh, because there are so many of them. And, um, and Thomas, if you want to tell us a little bit about what you're doing now, uh, yes, we're going to put this to the side and we're going to start on another one. Uh, as we're going, I, I was, uh, I, I think I explained earlier, I like to work on three pots, uh, maybe four, four at the most. But the bigger pieces, sometimes I do uh, two, two, two on the same day. Now I'm starting to calculate uh, how many days it's taking me because people will ask me and I've never really, uh, you know, paid attention how much time it takes, you know, to that, put... That's a really difficult question. Yes. You're not going out there to dig the clay for one piece. Right. And you're not cleaning the clay for one piece. And of 
all the, pro the, all the various parts of the process, uh, Thomas, that clay digging and clay cleaning represents about, what, half the time? Right, right. I, you know, the, the process of processing the clay, I think, takes a little bit more of my time. But I've kind of broke it down to where I kind of under, understand uh, how much time I put in there. Yeah. So, so with certain pieces of uh, how much time I put in there, you know, doing the numbers, you know, I, you know, just to be, not to be going up and down on my prices of the pots, I kind of put it down to where either it's between about $18 to $25 an hour on each pot. So I've kind of maintained the same level of prices that I will have on my retail and you, you, you as well. So with the, even with all the ribbons, the blue ribbons and stuff, I've maintained my prices so evenly that way my customers know too is they all keep coming back. They all keep coming back. Why? Because it hasn't got to my head or my mom will hit me over the head with something, <laughs> you know, because of the blue ribbon. Because I know a, a friend of mine one, one year won a, a, a good, good nice award over here. But the following year, I, he calls me to his booth for Indian Market, and he goes, and it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and he didn't sell one piece yet. And I said, and I said, what am I doing? What, what, did I, what am I doing? I said, so I looked, I picked up one of his pots, and I looked underneath. And, uh, I mean, he's deserving of, of the, the year before of the, of the, of the ribbon and the, the award that he got. But he just took it up so much percent, you know, and, and I said... Well, what he did is he priced himself out of the market. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So anyways, I said, this is, I, I'm telling you as a friend, it's an artist, I said, take these prices back down. And uh, sure enough, he did. I went back the first day, and then he sold some pieces, and he was, he's really thankful. And I said, I've gotten these awards, and I've gotten this, but I just maintain they're going to keep coming back, and they always come back. And they've always come back to the store here also, and they don't just buy one. I remember a lady from Florida, and she's, she's a real good customer of ours, and uh, I remember she, come, she came back seven years in a row, and she had seven, seven kids, I, I believe. I, I hope she's still around. Yeah, she was, <laughs> she was, she was getting older. Well, so, you, so that's what I've done is I just maintain my prices for the past 10 years. Let me put it well, that you way. Know, pricing is something that's really difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, it has a lot to do with the fame of the person who made it, uh -huh. the size of the piece, the quality in which it, mm -hmm. uh, the quality of the piece that's made, how it fits into the rest of the marketplace, how the economy is moving. And something that's very interesting is the expectation of the customer mm -hmm. because they may have a piece that they bought 10 years ago and all of a sudden that piece that they paid a lot of money for, mm -hmm. that piece is worth a whole lot less right. because the marketplace has changed and maybe the artist has changed and changed in their quality, changed mm -hmm. in the size of the piece they make. And so that, that pricing follows the roller coaster ride of many, many different things. Right. And for you to maintain your even pricing, uh, which I'm really surprised that the hourly rate is that much, Thomas, uh -huh. because I know how much time you right. put in to right. all of this. And maybe you don't factor in all that time that it takes to clean the clay, and uh -huh. maybe um, the time that, that you go digging or mm -hmm. the time you're delivering pieces uh -huh. to people and driving and, and spending time in here uh, with us even schmoozing because right. that's part of the process of selling 
uh, your pots as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm that hourly rate seems very, very high because I know how uh -huh. labor intensive all of that is and how many pieces you lose along right. the way. Well, I, 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 I'm glad you went back to that. We're, I, think, I think at that time when I was calculating, I was, we were counting about, about 15 to 20 pots. So I think that kind of changed, I mean, it, it varied, varied mm -hmm. just doing that certain count there. Yeah, I kind of, I, I kind of, I, I know I understand. Like I said, I'm not a businessman, but I'm learning, learning to be, I, I just love doing the art. Uh, I've got uh, my daughter that got deployed. She was taking care of all my business stuff and, you know, all the paperwork and stuff like that. So it was really tough on me this year that I had to take care of all, all the other stuff, packing, delivering, and, and so on and stuff. But uh, I've got another person that's doing all that stuff. So it gives me the time just to create new stuff. And I want to assure all, 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 the, all our customers, I sit here today and I'm going to tell you this, I have not done my best work yet. I, I, I know myself. I know myself. I have not done, done, done some of the stuff that I've seen from excellent potters. We're talking about from the 1800s, some pots that I've seen. And the walls so thin, the firing down to the to detail down down to almost perfect but it's not going to be perfect but i said like i said i sit here there's a lot more stuff i want to do you know the real traditional stuff but then again i want to do some other other stuff on the site uh you know different shapes and different stuff yeah but uh well, you know thomas that's really a mark of a true artist he's always mm -hmm. stretching mm -hmm. stretching and striving over and over because we, you know, there are some artists that repeat the same thing, like they were stamped out of a cookie cutter. And uh, the idea that, you know, you look to your ancestors and can recognize mm -hmm. the quality of their work, first of all, and then the, the idea that you want to be able to be as good as that, that person who made it, and the idea that you're willing to put the time in. And you know, most of those potters that made those incredible things uh, put their lifetime into yes. it. And you still have a long way to go before that lifetime is over. But before we go on a little further, okay. I have a, a question from Gail. Uh, Gail's from Truckee, California. I used to live in, I lived in Berkeley for a million years, okay. and Truckee is kind of the gateway to the Sierra, uh, Sierra mountains. Nevada, so yeah. yeah, to the mountains. And her question is, are the plants, I assume, the plants that you paint on your pots, are they not specific, like the bird is not a specific bird? I was, she was wondering about the five-petal flower that is on so many of your pots, including the one she has. And in other words, what kind of flower is it, or is it a non-specific flower? Uh, thank you for that question. I'm, I'm, you're the very, very first one that ever asked me about the five petal uh, flower. The reason the five petal flower goes in there is because there's going to be a stem coming down. So that's where it's going to open up at. And, and uh, you're going to put the stem so every, there's going to be two here, two here, and then on top. And then the the stem's gonna come come, and that's a great question. I I got the five petal petal uh five petal of flower from the book, from the book from a, a Chapman book, and uh, it just evens out it, it just evens out the flower itself self. And there's no no specific uh specific uh, type of flower. It is it's all what I see sometimes. But the vase with the hummingbirds, that's a new thing that I created, the, the tulip. The tulip, I was sitting around one day and I wanted to draw something, something different. So that's where the idea came from, was that tulip. Well, what it is, is I guess it's not a specific flower. What it is, is it's a design element. Right. And the convenience and the symmetry of the design element is... is 
better with five petals than with four or six or whatever might occur in nature. Right, exactly. And, and that the, the certain flower or the certain plant, I see, I see it before, before right after it's, it's, it's dry. I haven't even put the slip or anything on or I haven't sanded it, but I've already pictured what's going to go on there. So the, the veins and the flowers that has to fit on that certain pot. There's, you can't do, you can't do uh, uh, a certain, a certain, certain plant all the time on that. But because 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 the, the body of the, the pot is always going to be different. So think of the, Gail, think of the, the flower is not a chrysanthemum or a daisy, but instead a design element. Right, yeah. right. I have a bunch of comments and questions that I should read. Okay. So number one is from Sue. Is This is a wonderful gift for us in the COVID times. Thank you so much. Uh, the next one is, says Andrea, fantastic idea and presentation. Does Thomas have any older designs or symbols from his research besides the one he just showed us? Mm, which one did I show up? Which the, the ones the ones oh, are on okay. display there? Well, like a long time ago, what did what did you do? Oh, a long time ago, I I I did a lot of birds, as you can remember, and uh, I did a lot of other pueblos designs on on my pots. But in two thousand six, I strictly jumped back to the old Santo Domingo pueblo designs, right? And uh, you know, once in a while, I'll do something something different, different. But what you see nowadays is an old original uh, Kiwa Pueblo design that uh, that's that's been around for a long, long time, right? Okay, I have some more comments as well. So the next is from Toby. Toby says it's so wonderful to see a slice of the gallery. Thank you. And so we're going to, after we're done here with Thomas, cruise around the gallery with the cameras for a few moments mm -hmm. just to show a few things that we have in the gallery. The next is from Bill. Bill says, the live stream is super. Great seeing all of you. I'm not getting anything productive done today because I'm watching you. Wow, cool. So, we're we're productive. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And, and the, the next question that I have is from Michael. Michael asks, what is the dye you used for the colors on the pots? Uh, the dye meaning the black? Meaning the colors. What, the what colors? Okay. Uh, the black is the wild spinach. The background is, is a, we call it the creamy slip. The creamy slip, it's, the original color of it is kind of has, has a grayish, grayish tone on it. Sometimes, sometimes uh, it all depends how many coats you put on the pot because the color of the clay when this dries up is going to be a little more red, right? So that certain slip, the white slip, you're going to have to keep put that, put that on constantly for a whole day till you get, I'm comfortable with 15 coats. Sometimes 12 is going to do. Why? Because the clay is red, and every little thin, thin coat of that slip has to go to on top it. of another one, yeah. and another one, and another one, for this color of the red of the clay not to come back out during the drying stage or during firing. So that is very time consuming. So it, that gray slip is a gray clay, right, effectively, a gray, gray clay. that's watered down and then painted onto the surface. Yes, it's all you have to do is just add water. You don't even have to screen that at all. It's, it's, there's no rock or anything in it. It just dissolves. As a matter of fact, when I first seen it, I said, this can't be it. I said, I put it in water because it is, it is so, how should, what should I say? It, that certain clay is so thirsty, it just sucks all the water. It just sucks all the water out. And then I said, I put it overnight, and I said, I, this, can't, this can't be it. And I said, because I put my hand in there, and you know what it looked like? It was lard, dry lard or uh, 
uh, what do you call that kind of crisp? Crisco? Crisco, yeah. Huh. It looked like Crisco, the, not, not the liquid one, but the, 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 the whitish one. Well, yeah. may, maybe, Thomas, the reason that, that it is not as available as it used to be is because if it's so water-soluble, rain probably washed it away. Uh, there was probably a lot more 100 years ago than there is now, and rain took some care yeah, of some of I, that. I think the main, thing, the main thing that it's not around is because they, they keep it private. Let me put it that way. They, uh -huh. A lot of people probably know certain places where to get it. As a matter of fact, uh, a couple of my friends did some exploring closer to where, to where the slip was mined back in the day. Uh, in a different area of uh, BL, B, BLM land, gover government land. So anyways, they came back, they went uh, hiking that day, and they said, they brought me an example, and this, I said, I'm pretty sure this is it, but we got to soak it first. So they don't want to soak it till we know pretty sure when we're going to go back again. Mm -hmm because it looks the, the the raw material looks the same and it's probably the same vein the same mm -hmm. same vein because it's right in that area also now how yeah. about the red and the orangey color how do the you get those the orange color is same same clay it's, it's no no it's way no. different it's yeah this the red the red paint is more has it's more like a rock mm -hmm. it's more like a rock uh, why because why? Because I know it's more of a rock is because when I put it in water, when I dissolve it, parts of it dissolve and part of it is solid rock. Yes, part of it is solid rock. And uh, so, so it's a mineral that it's a, it's a it's mineral, a mineral it's a, that it's, exists it's a, at Santa it's, Domingo. It's, it's a mineral. And I believe uh, most of the potters, even including the black potter, they say they get it from that air, that area, you know, because it's it shines up real, really, really well. You know, even even with mine, if I take a cloth and start burnishing it with a cloth, I get that the real shine. But I hardly do it. I hardly shine my pots on the bottom. Mm -hmm. you know, I, and then there's yeah. a sort of an orangey color that uh, appears. What's mm -hmm. that? That, that that is the color of uh, of the of the clay of the of the slip. I call it a slip instead of a paint because uh -huh. it's really it really is a slip slip uh, along with uh, with this slip also. Well, you know, it's a misnomer. People call it the the potters call it paint, uh -huh. but the buying public thinks, oh, you go to Home Depot right, and right, buy a right. gallon. Well. The paint is really watery clay, mm -hmm. minerals, or plant material. Right. Uh, certainly not any um, outdoor acryl acrylic, or excuse me, outdoor latex with a um, eggshell finish. Right. No, it's it's uh, definitely the the materials come from Santa Domingue's from Kiwa, excuse me, Kiwa Pueblo, and um, right you find them out in nature and you process them in the way that you can apply them to the piece of pottery and that's what you call paint right you you hit it on you hit, you hit it just right it's you know the way i see it all these raw materials all these paints and stuff they all come together on the pot itself either chemically wise, spiritually wise, or whatever you, you want to call it. This one agrees with each mineral, each paint, each, each anything. They agree with it. They come together. They don't, have, they don't have, sometimes certain chemicals don't mix together, you know. But these, these kind of uh, stuff, they all come together. That's why, that's why, that's why you can see, that's why you can see that uh, there's no really no, it's not perfect, but the f there's no flaw or there's no like. Well, uh, your culture's had what a thousand years at least to figure it out. Yes, and yeah. I'm sure those things that don't come together got discarded long, long time ago. And you're fortunate enough to know from everybody's past experience on uh -huh. how how to, to put it together to make it work. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, I give a lot of credit to the potters before me. You know, before me. Even, even, even though, even, 
even though there's not much people telling, telling, telling this how to do it or how to, well, let me say, but there's not too many people want to teach it, yeah. want to teach it. So I want that to be my legacy, see, for my problem. I'm going to give it back. I'm going to give it, in other words, as a, as a, as a male from home, you know, this is, this is, I, I'm doing, I'm, I'm borrowing this art from, from the ladies at home. So that's my give back to them within a few years. I'm going to teach yeah. it back to them. Even if I have to hold classes at home, I held classes at home uh, before, but I hadn't figured out the chemistry behind the black paint at all. So there's a lot of my, uh, a lot of my old students are still asking me. There, there's maybe a couple of them still making pots out of 50 because I have a waiting list of about 75 people. We only could take in 25 the first time, the second time 25, and there was a li list of, no, I take that back, 175 people that still wanted to learn. We're talking about men, women, children that mm -hmm. want to learn. Now, yesterday when Ruby Panana was here, she uh, is from Zia Pueblo. She lives at Jemez Pueblo, and she said that in her village, that there are, in Jemez Pueblo, there are, excuse me, in Zia Pueblo, there are about 900 people, and there are only seven active potters. Mm -hmm. In Santa Domingo, you said there were about 5,000 people? All right. And how many active potters are there, I'm roughly? Gonna, I'm going to say roughly the real, the traditional stuff. Uh, the oh, traditional yeah, the, stuff. The, we, the others don't count yeah, as okay. far the as we're concerned. The traditional stuff, I can count probably like 10. I'm not 10 gonna, no, out of 5,000 people. Not more than 10. You right. better get busy teaching, honey. I, 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 I will. We I need will. to and keep I, this I, alive. I, 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 I promise this, I promise this. Not to anybody else, but I promise this to myself. That I well, and now that. you've promised it to the rest of the world because right, right. we have a, uh, what's it called, a channel on, uh, on, fa on, um, on YouTube, thank you, where uh -huh. all of this material is going to be deposited forever. Right. So if you didn't see rubies yesterday... Uh, all you have to do is go to YouTube and search for Andrea Fisher Pottery, and you'll see Ruby, and in an hour or so, you'll see Thomas Tenorio, because we will, this will be repeated there as many times as you wish to watch it. Who, who's that? Who's that guy? What guy? The guy that you just named Thomas, was it? Thomas, Thomas Tenorio. Thomas oh, that's that guy that's sitting over yeah, there. Yeah, that's that guy that's sitting <laughs> over there. Uh -huh. Well, as you can notice, I don't joke that much as I used to. Remember, I was awful. Like well, that. I think... I <laughs> think well, that was just my sense of humor. Well, yeah, I think yeah. there might have been some other substances <laughs> that, <laughs> that sort of gave you permission uh, to, to joke uh, more. Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, I, you know what? You, I guess you guys were moving some of some of my work. I thought we, I really thought we had more. I really thought we had more. I, I remember one year we had like, oh wow. Yeah. I mean, we. I mean, I took the whole there, island there, up. Yeah. There was a hole at Santa Domingo. There was a yeah, hole there was a, of a hole where you yeah, dug the clay there was out, a and it was crater, crater yeah. there. Yeah. I and it was that. all here, all made into <laughs> yeah. pots. Okay, if there's some more questions, more questions, I, I'll, I'm going to start on another one because this one's not dry, drying up for, to me to put another uh, coil on there. So I'm going to put this. Well, so Thomas, we do have a question, but I don't know if it is appropriate. It is, says some pottery has a green color. What might be the material that causes that color? A green color? I've never had that. Maybe green paint? I don't know. It's at Santa Domingo? It's Santa Domingo? Yeah, that's, that's, I'm just asking the question. Oh, you know what? Okay, I, maybe maybe this might have happened. One time, one time I sold these ladies some bowls, right? And they were using it, right? But I guess one of the bowls, they didn't clean out well enough <laughs> after they used it. And they put it back on top because that's how the ladies have their pot, their their potteries uh, displayed on top, and 
the food they didn't clean up over the. That's why it was green. I don't know that. I mean, that's that. That's the only thing because we don't have no black paint. I mean, green paint at all. Yeah. Yeah, and you should always be aware of the green paint. Is asking actually about Ray Tafoya. And Ray Tafoya is from Santa Clara Pueblo, but you guys are very different in different countries. Oh, we we're way different. You know, they they do have that green color. Uh, uh, Mr. Eric Eric Fender has the uh -huh. green color. As a matter of fact, he gave me some, and I tried it. Uh, on my vines, uh, my fish, we have my fish and the vines. And it, that was different. It, it, it came out neat. I, I have a picture of it. So what was it? Was it a rock? Was it a plant that, that he gave you? Was it? You know what? It was, it was, it was in liquid form. So I don't know. I, I didn't ask about the questions. On so it. it could have come from a craft store. It, it, it might have, but I fired it so outside. So we don't, we just don't know. Yeah, we, I, I don't know personally, but uh, I, you know, I kind of like asked him, and it's oh, it's he said it was it was natural, but I, who am yeah, I well, to know? Yeah, well, you know, at Acoma Pueblo, um, the the Lewis girls, Carolyn Concho, Rebecca Lucario, Marilyn uh -huh. Ray, Diane Lewis, and Judy Lewis, the the Lewis sisters, right. you will see on some of their pots little bits of green. Right. Uh, in fact, we, I can even pull one out of the case here to show sure, you what sure. I mean. And um, that, uh, excuse me a second. Here's a little. Yeah, so one. In the meantime, I'm going to ask another question that we got as well. Sure. How long must the pots be fired? And this is from Michael. How long is the firing? The firing, I... I've never really calculated the time. I'm way busy. But I'm just guessing from the time I built the fire, which is just to get, get the ground dry, uh -huh. till the time I take the, actually the pot out of the fire in to take home. I say a good maybe four to five hours, four to five hours. The main part of it is the cooling off. Cool, the cooling off. Once all the fire has subsided, I cover it with tin then. So that way a, 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 a gust of wind doesn't give it that heat, heat shock. But then again, when I'm firing the pot, you have to gradually take the temperature up because if you put the all the fuel around it so fast, it's going to give it that hit shock, and it cracks then too. So I've learned the process of that a lot also. So the preparation time is what, a quarter of uh, the time you spend? Yes, yes, a quarter and, of the and time. And then about a quarter of the time for it, the pot to be coming to temperature and getting to the mm -hmm. right temperature, and then half, half the, the time to half cool down. Half is the down. cooling off. Half okay. is the cooling off. Because, because I use I use wood that is that's so 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 uh, dry that I take mm -hmm. it to a, I take it to that temperature. I had a gun I had a gun to take uh, the temperature, and it only went up to nine hundred degrees. So we went to go get another one to check the temperature. The highest temperature my outside firing ever got. It was in the middle of August. We took it up to 1,200, 1,260-some degrees. Ooh. And that is hot. Yeah. And that is, yeah. that is in the middle of the afternoon at 3 o'clock in the afternoon with the sun baking so hot. Yeah. And what do you use for fuel? This is another question. Oh, uh, the fuel I use, I prefer, nowadays, I, pre I, I when I first started, I was using the bark, the cottonwood bark along the, the, uh, our river on the reservation, but now we're all into the preservation of 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 our um, our bosky area, you know, and stuff. So, for ten years in two thousand nine, they shut off our, our reservation for hunting, uh, fishing, for wood cutting, and so on. So all the stuff, the veg natural vegetation, come back. So in the meantime, I was thinking, what are we going to use? So doing more research. Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde, they were using, I mean, uh, cedar wood, cedar wood. So I said, 
okay, well, maybe let's get some cedar root bark. You're not going to find that much dry cedar root around that's going to do the temperature. And I said, what's the next best thing? Aha. In Albuquerque, where I used to live, uh, this uh, couple down the road replacing their fence. I went over there and I said, uh, are you going to get rid of your old fence? And they said, do you want it? And they said, yes. And they said, do you know what? They said, anyways, we got this in 20 years ago. They got, this fence was put in 20 years ago. And I said, do we, what kind is it? Some of it is cedar and some of it is, is, is pine, but I think most of it is cedar. Oh, ho. So I, I said, so I took it. So ever since then, about five years now, I've been using the old fence that's been sun-baked, sun-baked uh, in, in, in the neighborhoods of Albuquerque <laughs> as fuel. Yeah. And I'm telling you, you takes that temperature way up there. If I don't have the fence wood, I buy, I buy cedar from uh, guys from home. And, uh, you know, I get them to, to, to that long. But well, it, it can't, it's got to be completely dry. No sap in there. Well, you know, cedar's really an interesting wood because it's been used in New Mexico for centuries as sealing material. Because cedar, like the cedar chest that you might have right. to keep moss right. away, uh, cedar has a natural bug repellent in it. And right. when people use cedar for their ceilings, it was a way of keeping the bug population mm -hmm. out of your home uh, because mm -hmm. it was like you were living in a cedar chest. So I uh, have a question from what, what, Gloria. Let me go what? Let, can I jump back to yeah. the cedar? Okay, okay. Uh -huh. I, I, I was, a, uh, I was a, a wildland firefighter for, for so many years, right? So uh, one of the guys that's a regular employee, I was, I was just doing uh, uh, during the summer, summer times, summer times. So I asked him, because one year we were up in uh, Durango area and, you know, the, the fire had already gone through, you know, there's, there's a little left here and there. So anyways, they asked us to go in and start working, mopping up the area. And it's all cedar. It's all cedar wood there. And then, uh, then, then one of the guys that uh, has more experience from home said, said, I don't think we should go down there. He said, because cedar tends to reburn itself again. He goes, said, that's a safety issue. And everybody's standing around, wow. He said, sure enough, they sent us in there. They said, you know, one of the government bosses said, you're going to have to take care of it before the wind start picking up. Little did we know the wind started coming. That's that. And it reignited. It really ignited. We took off up, up the hills and left everything behind, all our machinery and stuff. It reburned. It wow. reburned. I, wow. I, this is a true story. This is a true story, and I believe it. So, that cedar wood that I use has an extra fuel somewhere in there. So, it, it reburns itself maybe twice during the firing state. So that's what keeps it, gets it hot. So Gloria wants to know, and I think this is a typo or an autocorrect issue, but she says, what is the process for laying out the resins on the pottery? But I guess resins means designs. Uh, let's see, I, I so what, say what that again. So what is the process for laying out do, the designs on the pottery? To draw it on first? Oh, uh, back in the day, back in the day, you can, you can, Draw on, draw on. I'm talking about the, the kiln stuff, right? You can draw on. You can draw on because the pencil marks are going to be taken. It's going to take off. It's going to burn the away. It's going to burn off. This, this paint and stuff, you can only make a mark here and there, but with your natural paint. Like, for instance, for the bird, all my designs are done freehand. All my diet are, are done freehand. And, uh, but sometimes you have to picture it out and put a dot here, put it like for right here, right here, right here, right here, right here at the points. So that way when I draw, when I start marking it in, because this paint, it only goes on one time. If you put it on, there's no erasing. If you make a mistake, 
It stays on there. That's too that's, bad, right? That's what it tells Have you. Have to incorporate. But it. everything is done free, free, freehand, freehand, and you know, if you've been it, doing it for so long, it just. It's a it natural thing. Natural. It's a natural thing. Well, you yeah. know, one time I asked a potter where she got her designs, uh -huh. and she said, I copy them. And it's like, what? And she said, yeah, I copy them. And, and in my na naivete, I said, where do you copy them from? And she said, I copy them from my head. <laughs> oh, anyway, no, that's good. Uh, can we, when, can we yeah, talk? Copy. Well, here, here's, the, here's the green. If you want to, because oh, the camera's okay. not on me right now. Oh, okay, okay, but all right. There's a little bit of green on oh, this yeah. seed pot. If you could show the, the camera that. A, they must have some sort of mineral that's this color. Exactly. What oh. Carolyn told me is that the mineral is very, very hard to find. And when she paints on the, on the, um, the surface, what color was the stuff that Eric gave you before it was green? You know what? It was a very dark green, but after I fired it, uh, it came out a, a little more lighter. Uh -huh. A little more lighter. But I know where you're going with that because yeah. one time I painted, I painted this mineral that I found. I painted, and after I fired it, the color of it was uh, kind of like a grayish color. Grayish color, and but then you know, it turned green after you fired it. No. When it, the one I, I got, uh -huh. after I put it on gray, but I believe the color of the clay and then it mixed together. Guess what color it came out? Huh. Green. Yellow. 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 Uh -huh. yes. And you know, yes. it's interesting because she uses yellow on hers too, uh -huh. but only in tiny, tiny little areas. Mm -hmm. My guess is that green is proper, probably copper of some of some it, it sort. Has, it has to be or yeah. or, or or maybe a, because when copper oxidizes yeah, yes. it turns green yes. and my guess is there's probably some copper and and also there are lots of copper mines in new mexico so the possibility of of being copper mm -hmm. as well and you know i didn't mean in any way to say that the, the, these were commercial uh -huh. paints at all oh, yeah. because you can get green and uh and a really nice color of green too uh, and from the the natural paints but um carolyn will be here uh demonstrating on saturday the 21st of august and whoever asked that question tune in then you, mm. there you can I'm, she'll I'm tell gonna, you exactly call, what she does i'm gonna call in or i'm gonna log in and ask and ask her that'll be a because that's a good question. Oh, we don't we don't take questions from oh, uh from oh, you, uh, artists. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm gonna have to come. Per, I'm gonna have to come in person. You better not have that door locked. Yeah, why don't you I'm tell them, him, you, you're a greet, Tell us you're a greeter at Walmart, and but, then you can you, then you can ask a question. You clicked something in my head yeah. right now, and uh, you know, basically, you know, I. Our colors is just those uh, three uh -huh. traditional color, uh -oh. colors. Uh, uh -oh. But you know what? I, I've never explored, you know, because there's a lot of lot of other m minerals around, you know. Yeah. But I've never explored it just to try. But my uncle, uh, Martin, Martin Lovato, he's a, he's a jeweler. He's always telling me when he's driving somewhere because he traveled all over, all over. He said, I seen that there's a clay. It was this color. So you should try that. Even like... Coming back yeah. from Albuquerque, have you seen that? Yeah, he's always done. Well, Thomas, you might get a head start on the 21st of August uh, by talking, you know, to Carol, and you can log in and and ask her lots of those oh. kinds of questions. I'm just giving you a bad time about oh, artists oh, I, I, not I being allowed. I completely <laughs> understand. But look at that. That's I like that. I don't mind working working something something more. I use it, like I said, I used it once, but I've never. Uh, I've never like really wanted to see what else was going to yeah. come out, but do you, yeah. Do you have another question? No, that's all the questions. Oh, I that's have all the moment. questions. Okay, well, you know, we're it's four o'clock. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it four? Yeah, it's four o'clock. Wow, that was so fast. No. Oh. Well, can I say something to everybody before I go? Oh, absolutely. Oh. I really had a great time. I love to educate what I do, you know, I mean, it's, it's not written in books or anything, uh, maybe just that book, just some basic stuff, but what I've shared was, you know, what the experience I went through to try and error, but uh, 
there's more to come from this. You know, I, I, I believe we can do more with the, with the clay. I had an interview in the Phoenix one year, and uh, they were telling me, you think you can do something else? And I said, yeah, I, I think I will. And I think I have. But uh, there's more and more to explore about this. But like I said, I want to teach it back. And I want to thank everybody that tuned in or whatever you call it. Uh, thank you for coming. And thank you, Andrea, for inviting me. I really have. I really enjoyed myself. Well, that was a quick four hours. Thomas, it wouldn't have been complete without you, that's uh -huh. for sure. And uh, thank you for sharing all of your uh, experiences, the 14 years all crammed into three hours. Right. And uh, it was, you know, it was joy, uh -huh. a joy to have you here. All right. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. We'll, uh, We'll, and, you see know, you. we'll see you all on the other side, man. This thing's going to end. Yeah, well, we've had such a good response. Uh -huh. And even though this is only the second day, right. uh, we had such a good response that we were thinking maybe this might go on other times during the year. Uh, because now we have all the equipment, you and, so, and it's, mean, we, and we it's can, fun. We can always do something like a... You know, different stuff like different, like contemporary. Well, are you, do, so now you're going to learn how to tap dance. I, I'm so, going to do how to do that. <laughs> you're going to be tap dancing if you're going to learn how to do uh, something are we different. Off? <laughs> are we offline? No, we're still. We're oh, we're still, we can off. still just oh, chat okay. away. One, one, one more question. Sure. For comments. Let um, me read it myself. The, uh, <laughs> one of the, the turtle piece was purchased by Ann Perkins. Ann would like to know what does the turtle symbolize to you? The turtle, the turtle symbolizes. Uh, we use the turtle in the in our dances at home, and uh, it's it symbolizes uh, spirit, spiritual, spiritual stuff. I I won't go in detail, but uh, it's very, very, very uh, spiritual. Spiritual. What, what I've heard from other pueblos, uh -huh. and it may be the same case in your pueblo or not, but what I've heard is. You could compare the, the turtle to the biblical Noah uh -huh. because turtles live both on the land and in the water. And when the great flood came, mm -hmm. the, the belief is that humanity climbed on the turtle's back right. and did not go into an ark, but climbed on the turtle's back and, when the wa and that, so the turtle could survive in the water. And when the waters receded, the turtle was back on land, and he dumped us all off, mm -hmm. and that's why humanity exists today. Well, well and, yeah, I, I, I heard stories of other uh, Indian nations. Yeah, that, other that Indian heaven, nations but, yeah. believe that right. about the turtle. But, you know, some mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. that are beliefs in Pueblos, mm -hmm. um, they are best kept within those Pueblos. Yeah, yeah, because, I, you know, that is the, the, in, the belief of the, the culture, and... Sometimes they just don't want to share it with anyone else, and you know who can blame them? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm 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 one of those guys. You know, I, I you know, I never yeah. say much as I, 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 you know, I, I keep it to a limitation. You know, just yeah. because of my faith. You know. Yeah, just of course, that. of yeah. course. And if a turtle is very spiritual uh -huh. for you, um, that's a personal experience right. that doesn't necessarily need to go anywhere else. But. You know, the, the turtle is really important, and, mm -hmm. and I just love the idea that the well, turtle saved humanity. Well, if, if uh, tell that lady to enjoy that, uh, uh, the turtle, the turtle bowl. Well, are we going to take a little tour around the gallery? Yeah, we're going to take a All right, tour cool. around the gallery, and then I'll sign us off, okay? Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate all of your work and everything else. Thank you very, very, very much. And if you have any questions about the gallery, we'll be back tomorrow. Do we know what time? What time is Hubert coming? Um, I don't. Oh, well, I we'll be back tomorrow. Check, check online. There's a, a schedule there. Talking? You can oh. Thank you very much. We really appreciate Thomas coming. I think this was really fun, and it was really informative for everybody who is here. Thank you, everybody.